I'm just going to done redirecting to YouTube. OK, welcome to uh, Tuesday's Hoofcast, Hoof Talk, whatever you want to call it, our broadcast. Welcome to our Hoof broadcast from Zoom. This is, uh, what is it? It is September 13th, 2023. And I've got to turn that down so I don't have to listen to it. Okay, so I'm going to put a picture of something up there just so people aren't looking at nothing. And um, let me see here. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to read you a page uh, in the very end of Henry Pamerling's book which is an amazing scholarly work that is just blown my mind. Um, so I just start out with first, I just want to share what something he wrote and some more about this book and about his article on the proper hoof angle. And one of the reasons for that, well, he's just such an amazing scholar, but then again, too, um, he really has some things pertinent to say. And being a hall, an International Hall of Fame farrier, not everybody gets into that. Um, he had a lifetime of experience. He died last year, he was 71 years old. And uh, I'm just so grateful to find his work. And I'm grateful to find it now and not earlier because I may not have understood what he was saying quite in the way it relates to tact and what we have learned of the history and the whole barefoot movement and trimming the heels out of these horses and the distortion it causes and the lameness and the death. Because ultimately that's what we're talking about. Um, if you try and form a horse's foot into something it was never meant to be, it can eventually lead to the total breakdown of that foot and it can eventually lead to the death of that horse. We all know that, no foot, no horse. Okay, so let me get you uh, a pretty picture up there to stare at while I'm uh, doing this. Let's see here. Um, hold on here. Well, what is going on? This PC. Okay, I'm forgetting what how to I'm forgetting how to run the computer. Put some pictures up here. Now, uh, what I need to know is that. Well, no, I don't need to know that because I don't want to uh, have a bunch of pictures going because I just really want you to listen to what I'm going to be reading. Okay, now I need to find you all again and share. Okay, so screen share here coming up. Okay, we'll just do this. Okay. Hi everyone. I'm not sure what's happened. I can't hear anything, but it's I've just got a notification saying I'm now the host and Linda and a few others have um left, so I'm not really sure what's happened.
shoot. There we go. Can anybody hear me now? Yes. We can okay, because uh, first of all, I kicked myself off of here somehow, but I was able to get back on. And then I looked up here and I saw I was on mute. All right, so sorry for the delay. Okay, so I'm gonna get a picture up here, um, which has now disappeared. <laughs> Let's not have it be that kind of day. Okay, just a second here. Okay, make that smaller. Uh, why is this not showing my picture? I don't understand. Just a second. Um, let's see. Okay, there we go. Okay. Well, anyway, that allowed some people to get here. All right, so so what we're gonna do, we're gonna start out today um, with a little bit of history here. Now, I have before me Henry Hammerling's book. Um, let's see, I need to do a uh, another type of screen share, maybe just a second. Okay, so Henry Hammerling, uh, you can also find all of his works at Henry Hamerling, H-E-A-M-E-R-I-N-G dot com. Now, he passed away last year in 22 at the age of 71. And uh, the scholarly works that he has done are amazing. Now, he wrote this one article this it's not really an article i'd say it's more like a research paper i would call it a research paper called the proper angle so who here has read that yet i have i okay. downloaded it actually oh good okay okay anybody else okay well i i suggest that you read that okay this is like tact required reading if you're you you need to understand see because i know that all of you want to help your own horses but i know and i've seen also where uh many of you all of you also look around and wish you could help other people well in order to be able to do that we have to know what we're talking about we have to understand and know the history of hoof care and the history of this thing of where they're lowering the heels for frog contact since the 1750s that has been killing horses ever since and so there is just some reading uh, of course i can't force you to do it it's not like you know i'm going to kick you out of class you know or you won't graduate i'm not that professor <laughs> but uh uh what i'm saying is it's really important that you read these articles that I give you this required reading. I mean, it's required because in order, you have to understand the history of this because you have to know these facts in order to be able to lead people into making a different decision for their horses. You know, if they have never heard about any of this stuff, a lot of people have never even heard that there is a different, uh, uh, an alternate, oh, now see, I'm losing my words option okay uh, another thing people need to know is very important is this word barefoot the word barefoot just used to mean horses that didn't have shoes on for one reason or the other um but it has come to be used by a specific group of people and about a specific method of trimming based on well one man's research primarily but if that would be jamie jackson but if you want to add hildred strasser in there them too okay and everybody that came after is just a follower okay that includes all the equine podiatry people um every every single barefoot blah 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 thing you can find online and that includes people like Pete Ramey, Dr. Boker, um, you name it, you name any of them. 
and they will all go back to these the beliefs of these two people and like with jackson nobody's ever researched his research okay tell me um and i mean you see you research when you're gonna you have basically what those people are giving us is medical information okay and they're saying something is true according to them well we need to look closely at their research to see how did they come to their conclusions and we need to understand these things so that we can inform people and I'm working on some stuff right now regarding that. So barefoot, the term barefoot specifically applies to them. Anything with natural hoof care or barefoot trimming, ultimately that represents a method of trimming based on their beliefs. Okay, so how did they come to their conclusions? Why did they think the way they thought? How did Jamie Jackson come up with the idea that all horses' feet uh, had one centimeter heels? See, I am understanding to understand how they came to their conclusions and their faulty reasoning behind all this. And so I am going to do a full expose on that uh, eventually here. But you need to understand the history even past them because the history before them has a lot to do with why they believed the way they believed and so it affected their interpretation and conclusions that they came up with on how you should trim a horse and what the true foot of the horse the natural foot should be whenever uh jackson anybody is talking about the natural foot you could just replace that word natural with the word true okay because they believe that's the true foot and so since they have a certain image in their head of what the true natural foot of the horse is and every domestic horse should have that foot see that's where that belief comes from and so so we need to understand a lot about that because we have to go back and we have to undo history and find out how they came to their conclusions and then find the real truth is what we have to do. So Henry Hamerly, very interesting man, and he wrote that article here. I'm going to get it on the Internet so people can see it. Just a minute here. All you have to do is, let's see, the, okay, I already got it in there. Well, there we go. The proper hoof angle, hammerling.com. Now, let me reshare. Let's see. Okay. So here's the article. It is one, two. It is, well, counting all the references, you know, that he gives. I mean, this guy's good at giving references. Look at that. Okay. On a 13 page uh, expose, treaty, research paper, whatever you want to call it. I ain't got any words coming to me like I need to today. He's got uh, one, two, three, a uh, little over three and a half pages of references. Okay. Now, his book that I have here, here, I'm going to look up a picture of it so I can show it to you. And thank you, Janet, for buying that for me. I mean, oh boy, that book. Great. So we're going to read the end of the page, the end of that book today, just uh, a kind of an end note that he writes on called mistakes. All right, so where was I going and what was I doing? Oh, this happens to me when I go into a room, <laughs> usually. 
Okay, where was I going with the computer? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, uh, on the horse. Horse is foot. Shoes and shoeing. Henry Hamerling. Ling. Okay. All right, we'll get the images here. Well, I don't have an image of his book. Okay, the book will go back. Okay, open library. Huh, it said it at the open library. Well, that's, that's interesting. Oh, it's not in the library. Okay, well, that's too bad. Somebody needs to talk to his relatives, whoever survived him, wife or whatever, kids and see if they will publish this book again um because it's out of print uh it it cost uh over a hundred dollars uh for me to get it thank you again janet um let's see here let's go back ha hammerling on the amazon let's see okay this is what the book looks like right here that i got before me um and i'm going to read the last part i don't think there's any uh in yeah see out of print limited availability okay so there are in this book now you notice it says uh it's a bibliographic record okay i'll show you what a bib just in case you don't know um like like the bible <laughs> <laughs> not quite but it's a collection well in a sense it is only it's a listing of every book that you could find written on the horse's foot and it's it in many different ways which i'll explain to you here in a minute so bib bib leo graphic graphic okay Ready, relating to bibliography. <laughs> okay. The history, identification, or description of writings or publications. So that is what this book is. That's all it is. And um, the history, identification, or descriptions of writings or publications on the foot of the horse. Now, there are... Uh, let me see how many pages in this book. 366 pages in this book. Just giving you a list of all this stuff of people writing in the on the hoof throughout the centuries. So it says a list with a descriptive. It's got all this in it. A list often with descriptive or critical notes of writings relating to a particular subject, period, or author. Okay, he's got all of that. He's got the list of the writings, the authors, the subject, the periods, the works. A list of works written by an author or printed by a publishing house. Uh, the works or a list of works referred to in a text or consulted by the author in its production. So, so I guess technically then, um, like even in his, where is it? Well, I'll have to get it up here again, just a minute. Okay, even in this, however long, 13 page uh, research paper he did on what the proper hoof angle and what people believed over the centuries. And this guy has, uh, again, how many? Four, four pages, here we go, of references. I guess you could say that as kindly, kind of, uh, kind of uh, bleh, I can't even talk. In a sense, the bibliographic record of uh, who he found this out from. 
So you see why this is such a great article that he took the time to find all these writings and uh, then tell you about what these people believed and what they have believed down through the centuries. Okay, so very, very, very interesting. Um, so his conclusion in all this, I'm going to read his conclusion. Then I'm going to go to the book, his book over here and read uh, the last page. He says, conclusions, for the first 2,000 years of recorded hoof care. Now, in this book that he has here, okay, first, he gives you the names, uh, A through Z, the names of all the different authors. Like, I counted them up. He gives you the names. It goes from page, let's see here. Come on. It goes from page one through page 20, with there being at least 40 names on each page. And I counted them up, and there are a minimum of 800 authors that he lists. That's in chapter one, authors. Chapter two is chronological list of books going by date, all right? Starting in 430 BC, 430 BC, and then uh, 380 BC, then nothing till 36 BC. Um, so the first two were Greeks, Simon of Athens and Xenophon, Phon, and uh, then, uh, a Roman, you can tell it's a Roman, Marcus Tarentius, 36 BC, 50, then nothing until 55 AD, then uh, Hippocrates, which was uh, 350 AD, um, and uh, then like 480, then nothing till 910. Then nothing till 1160. Well, why is that? Because there was no printing the press yet, people. Okay, so any book you made had to be meticulously copied by a scribe. So books were really expensive. Not many people wrote them. Okay, then, uh, then from 1160, there's nothing till 1250. Okay, but then there's another one in 1260 and 1270. And then nothing till 1307. And from 1307 to 1422, uh, nothing. And then 1425, now he's given the names. He's given what the, the book is about or the writing is about in all these. Then, then now the printing press was invented in four, uh, 1440, somewhere around there. Well, guess what? The writings increased dramatically after that. Um, like in 1471, you have them increasing after 1440 to where in 1471, you got a major publication uh, called The Good Husbandman. Um, and then, uh, let's see, I see I was counting them on. So just in the 1400s, the late 1400s, mid to late, you had one, two, three, four, five, five books written. Then the 1500s come. You got one, oh my goodness, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Well, we're still going. 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 33 uh, books written by different people on the foot of the horse after the printing press is invented in, in 1440 and then uh, in 1550 or in the 1500s. You got 33 books, boom. See, now 
Then you go into the 1600s. I'm, I'm not going to count them all because we'd be here a while because, man, it got prolific. And then it got even crazier in the 1700s. Oh, my goodness sakes. So all together, and of course, you know, in the 1900s, this, he, this is recorded up to 1990 before barefoot trimming, before Jamie Jackson and Hildred Strasser. Okay, they come out right after that. Jamie Jackson wrote his book, The Natural Horse, and published it in 1991 or two, 92. Okay, so this book was out before that. And uh, so on the horse's foot, shoes and shoeing, the chronological list of books, I counted them all. Uh, just a minute, I got to get to the end of them. And there were please, a lot. <laughs> okay, <laughs> a lot. Hey, come on, get to the end here. Here we go. Um, 1154 books written by 1990 on the foot of the horse. Now, if somebody was just right along the way somewhere, nobody would keep writing those books, right? They'd know they'd have the information they needed. You know, unfortunately, uh, from the 1700s on, the writing was prolific because of what it says here. We we'll go back here to his his deal. He says, for the first 2,000 years of recorded hoof care, a high hoof angle without frog pressure was universally recommended. For about two centuries following that, a low hoof angle with frog pressure was recommended by an influential majority of non-farrier writers. And who is that? Influential majority. Oh, well, you know, the vet school started up. You know, the, the second guy to run the Royal Veterinary College, Professor Coleman, who was a medical doctor, Okay, that guy never shot a horse in his life. So, and it's his book because he was the, the head of the school for 38 years. It's his book that then uh, all the farriers started following. And so it says, all evidence indicates that a healthy hoof angle is one of 54 to 60 degrees. Now, this would agree with Gene Ovenick's research. Without frog pressure, without that, I don't know if that really agrees with his research. Anyway, uh, okay, we know that in what range of angles to find and keep a healthy, healthy hooves. We do not yet know precisely what mechanism determines the most healthy angle. And uh, though it is clearly related to the distribution of weight in the hoof. Oh, you know what it's real. I'm going to tell you what it is. The right angle for the dorsal wall is whatever the foot is. <laughs> See, in all of this, they do not know the horse has a foot on the inside of there. Okay? They don't they don't see it as having a foot. They see it, they see the capsule as the foot and it has parts in it. And that's what they see. And they don't hardly see the last two thirds of the foot at all. So, anyway, says uh, da -da 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 -da. we do not yet know precisely what mechanism determines the most healthy angle, though it is clearly related to the distribution of weight in the hoof. If, uh, as I believe, the navicular bone shares with P3 the function of bearing the horse's weight. I don't agree with that, like, at all. All right. Then that may explain why an angle of 54 to 60 degrees is the most healthy. 
Um, this hypothesis will be explored in a future article. I have to see if you ever wrote an article on that. So that's a hypothesis. That's his theory. Um, so, okay, so he goes all through there and tells you what farriers have believed down through history. And uh, so now in this book of his I have before me here where I just told you there's, he lists and he describes what's in their book of 1154 authors starting in uh, 34 BC. Okay, that's no small task to find that many books because a lot of them were written in another language as well. That's why I say this guy, he was uh, not only a great farrier, but a scholar. You don't find too many scholars, period. I'm going to tell you that. You, you can find very few in the colleges. So not real scholars. See, I've read lots of old books. You know, you know that a kid in school 100 years ago was more of a scholar and what they're pumping out of these colleges these days. You know, I call this the dumbing down of civilization what we're getting fed, what they're getting fed in these colleges today. So, I mean, they didn't even know proper English. So then after, after he gives the chronological list by date of 1154 books with a description of what they wrote, um, and not only that, okay, he also gives where they mentioned other writers. See, he gives he gives their references that they used in their books of writers that came before them. OK, so <laughs> just a minute. OK, so. Chapter three titles. He's got periodicals from 1901 to 1888. And I don't know, there's 10, 20, 30, 40. Then he's got a list of books. Um, there's, I'll get you to, uh, I don't know how many pages, a numerous amount of page pages of the lists of books from A to Z. Now he gives the date there too, but it's not in chronological order. And he gives... As, as estimated, I count about the same numbers would have had been the same numbers over here about, but I got for sure 1127 under titles. Okay, so then not content. This guy, I like this guy. Oh, goodness me. Just a second. Got to take a little drink of water. And then, now we're at page 273, chapter 5, index by country. <laughs> American books. I didn't count them all up, but oh, my goodness. There's like 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, blah, blah, blah. Three pages of them. Uh, I'll have to count those up, but a lot, a lot of authors. Australian books, there's only one written in 1964. The American books go from 1735 with a guy named Burden to... Uh, 1989 with a guy named Jovich. And then they have the Australian books. One, 1964 by a guy named Spring Hall. Came out. Uh, oh, wait, no. And then one in 1990 uh, from the University of Sydney. Well, now we have Austrian because he's going in al alphabetic order. Austrian books goes from 1777 to 1974 and I would say there's uh, about 20. Okay, here we go. British books. 
Woo woo. He goes from 1270, a guy named Hensley, and there's got to be, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, uh, 70, 80. Well, there's several hundred. Several hundred going up to 1989. Uh, to a guy named Price for so from 1200 something to 1989 uh, hundreds of British officers writing about the foot of the horse Czechoslovakian one in 1956 Ooh, the year I was born French okay there's a lot of French books here but not not close to the amount of American or or books uh, from England Starting in uh, 1533 and ending in 1983. And remember, this this book came out in 1990. Um, now, LaFosse, our friend LaFosse is on here um, in 1754, where he came up with the bright idea that horses had to walk on their bulbs and frog. Uh, and he was just a would-be anatomist. He was no horseshoer. Okay. <clears throat> and when he came up with that, all of the farriers, marshals, in, uh, in France wrote a big old thing against him. See, because at that time, they were all leaving heels on horses. Okay, German books. Well, here you go, girls. Let's see here quite a few uh starting in 1498 albrecht a l b r e c h t let's get lots of german names here um to 1987 mueller and there has to be let's say let's see 10 20 35 70 70, 80, 90, 120, there, it's going to be easy, 200 riders here. From Germany, on the foot of the horse. Oh, then we have a Hungarian book, 1959, Horvath. Italian and Byzantine books go, um, there's probably 40. <clears throat> Go from uh, 430, Simon of Athens, uh, Xenophon is uh, listed here, um, goes from uh, 430 to 1981. Uh, Latvian, Latvian books, 1883, three of them, 1928, uh, not all different authors, you know. Netherlands, here we go, the Netherlands. There's one, two, three, four, five, ten, about 12. No, wait, I'm not looking at the other side. <clears throat> okay, there's probably 20. Polish, there are three. Russian, there are like 12. Scandinavian, um, 12, 13. Then South African books, 1982, Van Kryenberg. Spanish books, I'd say 25, unclassified. You don't know who wrote them or where they were from, I guess. Um, there's 10. Okay, so that's chapter five. Chapter six are just books, just writers, um, starting with... Uh, Oh, this is by date. Writers and artists um, that mentioned the foot or worked on the foot of the horse. And chapter six is called Anatomy, Physiology, and Biomechanics. <clears throat> Starts with 1260. Some guy named Becker Ibn Badar. Sounds like an Arab. And then the next one is Da Vinci. You know who that is, right? 
that was 1499. So it goes from 1260, somebody studying some anatomy in 1260 to 1499, which we know Da Vinci studied anatomy. Goes through the 1600s. Um, let's see here. Okay, there's a lot of names here. Okay, um, this is before, let's see. Well, I don't know. Anyway, that. And then you got chapter seven. Uh, histories. People given histories and has like, I don't know, a few hundred authors. Then you got timeline, his, just a general timeline of history with the major events that happened starting from 4000 BC, uh, where it says, First evidence of domest of horse domestication comes from this period in the Eurasian steppes of the Ukraine. Well, isn't that interesting? Again, of course, he gives reference for all. In 3500 BC, Tubal Cain, the first blacksmith, a furbisher of every cutting instrument of copper and iron. Can anybody tell me where you find his name? Anybody know? Tubal Cain. Hello, just say no or maybe. Hello, is anybody there? Yeah, just uh, just to try to find the the button to unmute oh. myself. <laughs> okay, Tubal so, Cain. In this, in you this know case, who no. he is? No, no. In this case, okay. no. Okay. See. Otherwise, I can maybe you can uh, do a new share screen and I can read it maybe oh, when Tubal I read Cain? the name. Okay. Uh, Let's see. Maybe here. when I read the name, it should be better. Tubal Cain. Let's see. Um, let's I gotta spell it. T U B A L slash C A I N. Tubal Cain, the first blacksmith. <laughs> Wait till you hear where he comes from. Man, they are just really not wanting you folks to know your history. Tubal Cain. Tubal Cain. Right here. Do you see, uh, am I sharing here? Do you see the picture? Anybody? Tubal Cain, the first blacksmith. Tubal Cain or Tubal Cain? No, no, in this case, no, I don't know. Okay. I well, no. Okay, so you know the legend, which I know, I believe it's all true, but. Uh, of uh, Adam and Eve, and then they had two sons by the name of Cain and Abel, right? And of course, then Cain was jealous of Abel, kills him, and uh, he gets driven out from God's presence into, I can't remember, was it the land of Nod? Something like that. And he finds himself a wife, a couple wives actually, and they had children, and one of those children's name was Tubal Cain. And he is known as the first blacksmith, the first person to be able to figure out how to get iron out of the earth and form weapons. See, a forger of all instruments of iron. So that's in Henry Hammerling's book here. He was obviously a Christian, or he wouldn't have put that in there. All right, and then 2000 BT, BC, Mesopotamian plaques and correspondence of the kings of Mari provide the first direct evidence of riding horses. Okay, 1400 BC, the Iron Age begins. 1184 BC, Trojan War, Trojan Horse. Okay, and uh, anyway, it just goes on and on. He gives uh, really a nice timeline of history and uh let's see and then okay to do to do timeline references he gives i mean this guy he didn't do nothing without giving a reference you know what if if all the people in barefoot trimming starting with jamie jackson would have given 
a reference from where they learned their stuff, his name would be right there. And going back, well, it'd be like, okay, Pete Ramey, Jamie Jackson, Hilda Strasser, blah, blah, blah. And then, and then really, they they also give references. I mean, Jackson gives certain references in his book as well. Here's the thing. Jackson could not find any books on hardly at all on horseshoeing or 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 the horse's foot. Isn't that interesting? Um, you can't look at all these books I've just labeled to you, and you can't hardly find any. See? Um, all right. So anyway, chapter 10 is called Mistakes. Here, I'm going to put this onto a different deal here. Mistakes that he gives this book, that he does this book of all these writers. Oh, and the dedication. I want to read to you the dedication. It says, dedicated to you searchers and researchers. Isn't that a mind blower? I mean, can you even begin to imagine the work and the time that it took this man to collect all this, let alone have it put in this book that is absolutely beautifully bound. I'm telling you, this guy spent a lot of money to have these books printed. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I mean, the time he took to research this is astounding, astounding. That's why this book needs to be in print again. Okay, yeah, so dedicated to you searchers and researchers. Uh, when I found out this guy died last year, because I was reading his stuff, I cried. Really, I cried. I didn't even know him, but I cried because, see, um, man, I just know what it takes. I know, I know the time and the heart and everything that he put into this. So anyway, so chapter 10 is called Mistakes. And uh, let's see here. Uh, new share, let's put it on. Oh. I'm looking for my picture to put it on while I'm doing this. Well, we'll just put it on this because this is a foot I was going to discuss that was a screenshot of a video that's on uh, our group. But anyway, okay, so this is called Mistakes. And it's chapter 10 of what I've just been showing you. And he says, many writers have noted that mistakes have been passed on for so long that they are hard to discover and remove. That is the story of my life here, the last 18 years, discovering these mistakes and seeking to remove them and seeking to find out what's right. See, it's not enough just to know where you messed up. You got to know how to do things right. Indeed, some of these mistakes form the very foundation of our beliefs about horseshoeing. So remember that. Okay, now, uh, all these people that uh, really got the barefoot movement going, what were they? They were farriers and vets. Farriers and vets. So they were. Uh, indoctrinated with these mistakes. And if they weren't mistakes, then people wouldn't have been looking for other answers elsewhere. For the most part, these errors have been started by writers who had little or no practical experience in shoeing. Oddly, the majority of riders on horseshoeing have had little or no practical experience. Just imagine if that was your doctor. <laughs> 
Most of these errors were authored by veterinarians at the time when they were trying to differentiate themselves from and compete with the farriers. Not exactly an unbiased position from which to write about shoeing. As Smith, now see, I see this perfectly because of, of all the studying I did about Bracey Clark and the first vet schools and Professor Edward Coleman, you know, uh, the nemesis of the horse. And so I understand this, how they were in competition. And you can read about it in the old vet journals and things like that. And I have, uh, several years ago, I made a video called, uh, what did I call it? Farrier forgery. The lies they believe. Okay, before I ever read any of this or knew about this guy or knew about Bracey Clark, I did a video, it's like an hour and something long, on the history of the stupid things that farriers have been led to believe. And uh, so you, you should watch that. Farrier forgery. The lies, something, the lies, the diabolical lies they believe or something like that. Oh, hold on. Okay, I'm back. Okay, now, um, mm -mm -mm, where was I? Yeah, not exactly an unbiased position from which to write about shoeing. As Smith, 1976, said in writing about LaFosse, who lived in 1754, it is remarkable how truth may be lost while error is certain of vigorous growth and longevity. Although LaFosse had some important discoveries, which were lost to history. <laughs> See, this is so ironic. So LaFosse is the one that came up with, oh, well, horses need to walk on their frogs and you need to lower the heels. Okay, and this was totally false. And yet he came up with some things that were actually good discovered. And, and this got spread all over. And yet he came up with some actually good things that were right. And they just got lost. Never got spread around. See how screwed up mankind is? You got to love the truth, people. You got to seek it. You got to search for it. You know, and then once you get it, you better hold on tight. It's a matter of life and death. It is remarkable how a truth may be lost while error is certain of vigorous growth and longevity. Although LaFosse had some important discoveries which were lost to history, in particular, uh, Lyperdion as a coagulant, he was, if not the originator, at least a very early proponent of most of Schuing's long-lived mistakes. So all these people have been working on your horse and all these people who write books, they are full of it. They are full of it. They are full of these mistakes. And this is why you see people get so weirded out and mad because it's not the truth. It's become like a religion. To them that's and you see these went so nasty nasty barriers nasty barefoot women okay says um dun, 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 dun. other than a mention or two of greasing the hoof wall i found no trace of any of these mistakes before 1750 okay so 
what we read about the conclusion in his other paper on the proper hoof angle right that for the previous 2000 years people believed in a high heel with the frog off the ground then the boss comes along and he okay he had the money to print a super fancy book I found one for sale online, probably cost you a couple thousand bucks. And so people, let me tell you what, the written word, folks, the written word, you write it down, it becomes the gospel truth, whether it is or not. Okay, so, so these mistakes were really not around before 1750. And Lafosse, uh, he, he showed up with his uh stuff in 1750 <laughs> some okay typically these mistaken ideas are seductively obvious and once you have adopted them as correct they serve as a rotten as rotten foundation blocks i gotta read that again okay because see i understand this whole thing of your foundation of knowledge okay you you build on your foundation it's like when we go to school we learn our abcs our one two threes we learn to to read and count that foundation is the building blocks for us and so if we're not taught a right foundation we will never read correctly as it is, people don't read correctly anyway, because they do not read the context. And when you don't read the context or you don't look at the broad picture, you can take something out of context, you can misunderstand it, then you give your interpretation to it and it winds up being not true. When something isn't true, do you know what that is? It's a lie, whether you meant to or not, it's a lie. See, he's talking about mistakes. That's a nice word for it. He reminds me of Bracey Clark. How Bracey Clark said um, he, he started to discover that the reasons given him from farriers for why horses' heels were contracted were not real. Were not real. Meaning they weren't true. It was a lie. Now, does it make any difference whether you're lying on purpose or you were taught to lie or anything? No, it's a lie. It's not true. It's a lie. But, but you know, they're they're more tactful <laughs> than me. <laughs> they made mistakes. <laughs> they lied. They believe a lie. They live a lie. They practice a lie. Lie, 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 lie. Okay. So he says, I'm going to read this over. Typically, these mistaken ideas these lies that people believe are seductively obvious and once you have adopted them as correct so you believe the lie is true they serve as a ro as rotten foundation blocks for further errors to be built upon man this is profound like this is so cool reading this out loud because like i read through this you know but in going back through it now it i'm like astounded at this guy i'm gonna cry again that he's dead oh god for example it is on now i gotta read that again i just got to okay Typically, these mistaken ideas are seductively obvious, and once you have adopted them as correct, they serve as rotten foundation blocks for further errors to be built upon. Wow. For example, it is only too obvious that any shoe projecting behind the heels of the front feet provide opportunity for the shoes to be accidentally pulled off by an overreach. Therefore, 
many owners, trainers, veterinarians, and shoers insist that no shoe project behind the front heels. However, when you find that Seattle Slough and Man of War raced and won in egg bar shoes, and when as a shoer you see horses that with regular shoes forge with every step, overreach and pull their shoes, as soon as the egg bar shoes are put on, their front feet frequently change to horses that no longer forge or overreach or pull their shoes. It becomes clear um, that the obvious isn't necessarily true. See, the obvious isn't necessarily true. Now, when I read this uh, yesterday, or the day before, can't remember. Um, and I was reading this, and I it started dawning on me why he's right and why they're wrong. Okay, so we know that when uh, you overtrim the heels, that it reduces the size of the capsule, and that the the placement of the heels, while they think they're trimming them down to the back of the base of the frog, and you know, giving more support. In reality, eventually what starts happening is the foot starts getting bound and being compressed and everything starts moving forward and you have false heels. And so you're removing that foundation uh, in the back of the foot. See, well, let me do this here. Wait a second. We'll do a uh, annotate on the picture here. Okay, so what color is that? E green. I want a different color. Let's do red. All right. So you look at this horse. This horse has a pretty good uh, cartilage here. All right. See it? Right there. All right. But the heels are being trimmed out of this horse. And so he's got too small a capsule. And his bulb's kind of sticking out the back there. Well, he's really supposed to have a foot that's back like this. See there? Okay, so let me see. Clear, clear. Oh. Okay, so he's missing some of the foundation. So if you put shoes on this horse and you allowed the shoe to just stick out a little bit further back, that's going to act as a heel that he's missing that's been pulled up and under. And so his foot is actually going to function better. See? So that is, now he didn't know why. But I, what I'm saying is, I'm telling you why what he says is true. So I want to read that again. So it says, um, where is it here? Da, 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 da. Typically, these mistaken ideas are seductively obvious, and once you have adopted them, oh, seductively obvious. I'm See, I was having a hard time kind of getting that. Um, how can a mistake be seductively obvious? Oh, because it looks logical. It looks logical. It's seductively obvious. Look, that's just logical. If the shoe's sticking out behind the foot, and then he reaches forward with the back feet, he could, he could... He could, like, his foot could go on that and, and then pull his shoe off. Okay? So, see, it's seductively obvious. It's, it's seductive because you think uh, you've come up with an idea or an answer or a conclusion, and it seems logical. But there are facts that you don't know that if they were added into the equation, it would present a different conclusion. So these mistakes, these errors are seductively obvious, meaning it's obvious to you that you're right, even though it's a mistake, because you don't have all the information in your brain. Okay, so 
Typically, these mistaken ideas are seductively obvious, and once you have adopted them as correct, they serve as a rotten foundation blocks for further errors to be built upon. This says it all about what is known of as natural hoof care and barefoot trimming. Okay, it is one error built on another. Starting with Jackson and Strasser going into Ramey and Henderson and Teske and anybody else you want to name. And then, uh, yeah, see, just one error upon another. And, oh, and Boker, that's the name I was trying to think of, okay? His physiological trim, he calls it, where you keep lowering the heels so that the frog kisses the ground. Just kisses the ground. Okay. First of all, uh, he's just doing the same trim Jackson does. Just give it a different name. Whether it's a four point trim or the F trim or the this trim or the that trim, you take them all back to there and it's just one error built upon another. Which is why this horse here is having problems. Okay, so rotten foundation blocks upon which other errors are built. And so you have a whole house of cards. Uh, okay, so ex here's an example, again, that he gives. Where am I? For example, it is only too obvious that any shoe projecting behind the heels of the front feet provide opportunity for shoes to be accidentally pulled off by an overreach. That does seem obvious, right? It makes sense, doesn't it? Okay, all right. But uh, therefore, because this seems so obvious, we look and we go, well, yeah, that, you know, that makes sense. He says, therefore, many owners, trainers, veterinarians, and shoers insist that no shoe project behind the front heel. However, now he's going to give examples where this did not ring true. When you find out that Seattle Slough and Man of War raced and won in egg bar shoes, and, and these shoes they will extend back behind the heel, obviously. And when as a shoer, which he's a shoer, see, he thinks, he's a thinker, this guy, you see horses that, so you're going to see horses that with regular shoes, shoes that uh, they don't stick out behind at all. They have on regular shoes. They forge with every step they overreach and they pull their shoes with regular shoes on the front, regular. But as soon as you take those shoes off and you put on egg bar shoes on their front feet, um, frequently these horses change to no longer forging or overreaching or pulling their shoes off. It becomes clear that the obvious like isn't always true isn't necessarily true you know just because it seems obvious doesn't mean it's true okay so so that's an that's interesting now let me explain again real quick here so this horse here look at he's got huge cartilages let me uh undo this try and make this picture a little bigger it's kind of blurry but you can see it you can see that this horse has huge cartilages here. He's got big feet, this horse. But the feet are, he, his back feet are shod. His front feet are bare. You can tell it, he's got broken hoof wall. Um, the capsule has been reduced. Um, it's just uh, not a very good foot. So this heel, let's see. Uh, let me find annotate. Okay, so, so his heel is like right here, right in here. But look at his cartilage, how far it sticks out behind here. So 
in reality, we know that his true foot heel is clear back here. See, and also this is this would be the size. I bet he has little to no sole there. See, his foot is ending here, but it should be about this, have at least that much foot on him. And so, so when he reaches forward, it's this part of his foot right here. Now this is back foot, but it is the same on the front. His real foot, his real heel purchase is back here. Not here. So mechanically, and as far as function goes in those front feet, okay, that foot has to have something back here to catch it. It ain't got no heel. So if you came in and you put a shoe on him that just kind of extended this out a bit, it's actually going to make him function better. It's going to make the way he breaks over, the way his whole foot functions closer to what it's supposed to be uh, because you got the heels trimmed out of him. See? Now, doesn't that make sense? Why this would work, what he's saying here? Um, if you don't understand what I'm saying, you can go rewind this tape and listen to it. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to write this out. I'm going to type it out and I'm going to post it online as well. So you can read it. It's very important to understand these things, not only in regards to the horse's foot, but everything in life. We have to know the truth about everything. Because anywhere that you don't know the truth, anywhere that you believe a lie and think it's the truth, you're going to suffer consequences one way or the other. Okay, like, like I could eat all the lead paint I want. <laughs> okay, mercury, what the heck, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. See, I played with all that stuff when I was a kid. <laughs> Let's see. All right. It says, uh, because these errors have been repeatedly taught and accepted, it has taken an open mind and many years of experience to unlearn them. I love this guy. I love this guy. I I'm I mean I just am like kindred souled here. I'm going to read that again because these errors have been repeatedly taught and accepted. It has taken an open mind and let me tell you what these minds don't open easily. None of us do. Okay? It has to be kind of like uh, truth has to get just a foot in the door, <laughs> you know, to keep you from kind of closing it. All right. Because these errors have been repeatedly taught and accepted, it has taken an open mind and many years of experience to unlearn them. So these errors were in the minds of the people that started the barefoot movement. They didn't come up with all this on their own. They're just passing down errors, the errors of La Fosse, basically. Because these errors have been repeatedly taught and accepted, it has taken an open mind and many years of experience to unlearn them. How many people have heard, heard me talk about how you have to unlearn things? It says, as Gamgee, this, this is a person, with a strange name. But anyway, as Gam Gamgee in 1871, uh, an enlightened veterinarian and shoer, after 50 years of practice, study, and observation observed that very much of what he has been called upon to believe in and rely on as scientific knowledge was nothing but verbose trash or the expression of crude hobbies. How about that? So this veterinarian, after 50 years of practice, he states this. Again, I'm going to read it again. 
Um, do -do 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 where am I? Very much of what, okay, he says very much of what he'd been called to believe in and rely on a scientific knowledge was nothing but verbose trash or the expression of crude hobbies. Gamgee's book is remarkably free of these common errors, but he was not able to turn the tide. Individual farriers cannot educate masses of non-shewers and inexperienced farriers. These errors have been perpetuated because horseshoers have not succeeded in controlling their own profession. And it is unfortunately likely that they will continue to be perpetuated until such a time as experienced farri farriers control their own profession and horseshoers experienced judgment uh, is relied upon. Well, they'd have to be straightened out first, wouldn't they? You know, and now what you see is that there's this whole educational process going on where making horse owners and people think they know when they don't. All you have to do is get on a hoof group, okay, and see the owners are uh, uh, parroting the same barefoot BS. See? Okay, so, so now... Uh, see, this makes our job even harder because now we have to unlearn people. <laughs> okay. Correction of the following mistakes will be, uh, okay. Correction of the following mistakes will be great, will greatly increase your understanding of horseshoeing and increase its value in extending the comfort, comfort and utility of the horse. This guy was great. So I'm going to read what he said. It's a mistake. I don't know if I will agree with all, but we'll see. It is a mistake. Well, let's see. How many mistakes does he give? He has 10 major mistakes. Number one, it is a mistake to think that moisturizing hooves is beneficial or that it helps maintain flexibility. Okay, see, and I read this the other day and I went, no, he was wrong here. Moisture is good. But if the foot is real bound up like Dodo's was and it got too much moisture and you hadn't grown the hoof capsule back yet and the, and the periopal released, then the, the foot releases into nothing and you're like trying to play catch up. So he is wrong about this, except for the fact when you are like my horse thrives on water. My horse's feet thrive on it. And uh, so he says, but I'll read it anyway. It is a mistake to think that moisturizing hooves is beneficial or that it helps maintain flexibility. Moisture only makes hooves softer, less able to withstand wear, and more easily deformed. The drier hooves are the stronger, tougher, more resilient, and better, better they are, better they are. Okay. Well, you know. Uh, we kind of know some different things about that, that horse's feet do need moisture, that if a horse's feet are anatomically correct, moisture is good. Now, you wouldn't want them uh, standing in water 24-7, that is for sure. Horse's feet got to get dry too, but moisture is good. And uh, uh, yeah, so common sense with what we know from tact and that. Okay, number two, let's see what he says here. Is mis This is true. It is a mistake to think that a 45 degree hoof angle is normal. A hoof angle of less than 53 degrees is a contributing factor to run under heels, navicular disease, bowed tendons, and a host of other problems. A healthy natural angle is from 53 degrees to 63 degrees. Now, this is right on with Gene Ovenek's research right on the money of wild horse feet that he did in 86 and 87. And I found some pictures of it yesterday. So there we go. Now that's another required reading. 
wild horse hoof pattern offers hope for domestic horses. You know, the research done by Gene Ovenick. Um, it, number three, it is a mistake to think that shoes sh should not protect at all behind. Oh, okay, wait a minute, blah, blah, blah. It is a mistake to think that shoes should not project at all behind the heel of the hoof because that might predispose them to be pulled off. You see, he mentioned this. We read about it before. Because overreach involves locking the inside edge of the toe of the hind shoe against the heel of the front shoe. Short shoes are just as easily pulled off by overreach as full fit shoes. Now that's interesting. So I guess that that if you uh, fit the shoe to the foot and the heel of the shoe just ends right at the heel. That is called short shoeing. And um, what is it here? And full, full fit is where you extend the shoe behind the heel somewhat. Okay. More importantly, because it helps keep the heels from sinking off the ground, a little extension of shoe behind the heel of the hoof will actually reduce the likelihood of overreach. That makes sense. Shoes are more frequently pulled because the heels are not long enough. Woo! All right. Number four mistake. <clears throat> it is a mistake to think that the normal horse's hoof needs frog pressure. Yay! Hallelujah! It is a mistake to think that the normal horse's hoof needs frog pressure just because it is useful in the treatment of some hoof diseases. <clears throat> 15 years ago, this was still an issue. Though Emery, another writer, 1977, <clears throat> and others have proved that frog pressure is neither necessary nor desirable in a healthy hoof. Number five, now remember, this guy is a Hall of Fame farrier, International Hall of Fame farrier. Number five, it is a mistake to think that hoof expansion or flexibility is desirable, that the sole should be thin to encourage expansion, or that the nails do damage because they inhibit expansion. Although a healthy hoof may flex slightly, uh, like what's, I can't even read that, one fiftieth of an inch while bearing weight, it is neither necessary nor helpful and should definitely not be encour encouraged. <clears throat> now, I agree with that, but I also see times when you have super, super contracted heels and uh, it's just compressed all this sole and you just have lots of retained sole and thick sole in there. As long as that's in there like that, your foot is not going to expand. It just won't because it's glued together. Okay, so there's a balance on that. Number six, it is a mistake to call shoeing a necessary evil. It is neither necessary nor evil. This phrase became popular at the same time that moisturizing hooves to promote expansion flexibility was popular. Moisturizing hooves makes them unable to stand wear without shoes and makes it very difficult to keep the shoes on. Shoes can be beneficial. Number seven, it is a mistake to think that the shoer can balance a horse by trimming his feet. Yeah, I agree with that. You can't. You got to grow a correct hoof capsule. You cannot trim one. Now, you can, you know, work on doing a, a level balance trim or whatever. But it says it is a mistake to think a shoer can balance a horse by trimming his feet. The horse and rider balance themselves. We can only help the horse by trimming his hooves in imitation as natural wear, which changes according to the way he is used. 
Number eight, it is a mistake to think that the hoof is a frustrum of whatever that is, of a cone. Okay, that's obviously some geometric pattern. A healthy hoof more closely remembers the frustrum of a cylinder. I'm going to have to look that word up. New word alert. <laughs> okay. But since he's talking about cylinder, I know it's some sort of geometric thing. All right. It is a mistake to think that horseshoeing is a craft composed only of simple skills, the most important one being shoemaking. If that were so, monkeys, machines, or inexperienced persons could easily do the work. Like surgery and dentistry, horseshoeing requires, in addition to mechanical skills, complex mental skills. Yeah, tell me about that. And a certain feel, which can only be learned through experience. It will be a long time, if ever, before a computer can be programmed to make the decisions necessary to properly shoe a horse. And that's why AI will always fail. <laughs> okay. 10. It is a mistake to think that by corrective shoeing, we can eliminate most gait and conformational problems, as in Adams. Adam, I've talked about his book before, Adams and Stishek's, if I pronounce that right, Lameness in Horses book. He's quoting him now. 1973, page 402, said that a skillful horse sure can control the position of the horse's foot at rest and in flight. Huh? That is no more true for horses than it is for people. Okay, so he's saying Adams is wrong. Uh-oh, that's the horse shooter's Bible now. When we have shoes for people that control our stance and foot flight without doing a serious damage, let me know. <laughs> okay, whatever farriers certainly can make, whatever, or wait, no, didn't say whatever. <clears throat> While farriers certainly can make minor adjustments, which allow a horse to use himself better, we cannot make a horse do anything. Therefore, our goal in shoeing should be to enable, not to coerce. Okay, so that is that is quite, quite the article. Wow. Wow. Quite the end to his book there. And so that's what tact is all about correcting mistakes learning where we are being mistaken see um you know i was indoctrinated with all this stuff and thought it was true only to find out it wasn't how did i know it wasn't because my horse was not being sound like he should be oh excuse me you sound on soft dirt and sand <laughs> That's not sound, people. Okay. Sound is when he, he can at least walk over a gravel road and not gimp four or five times every time he hits a stone. You know? Okay. So anyway, um, that is from the book uh, On the Horse's Foot. A amazing scholarly work. Amazing. All right, so started at 11, it is 1236. I'm gonna uh, take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back and do some feet. There's also, there was one gal that was supposed to come uh, whose feet I was gonna look at uh, about the fact that her toes were getting long. Is that person here? She's on the group. The toes on her horse are getting long. She's been intact for a while. And uh, she took a wrong turn. Uh, and so she went into another kind of hoof distortion there. And so I was going to talk to her. And I found a video you all appreciate on this gal. Uh, in fact, I found this trimmer. I was actually amazed uh, that she uh, uh, believes much the same as we do. Okay. 
and uh, has pretty nice web page and different things like that. And she had a pretty good article on uh, on what she believed about this thing that farriers always teach about taking back when you take the heels back, you know, you're really taking them down. Well, she don't believe in that, and she's been growing heels on horses, and and she had a pretty nice web page and some nice articles. Um, and I didn't think I'd ever heard of her before, but then when I typed in some stuff on Facebook, I found that I had shared one of her her posts before, and uh, it was back in 1919, I think. Nin no, 2019. <laughs> that would have been a long time ago. 2019 when uh uh anyway she was looking at foot and she said oh look at this healthy frog and i was saying okay guys here's something you need to know this is not a healthy frog they're still not recognizing what is healthy frog what isn't um so i realized well gosh you know i had commented on her uh something she said way long time ago but now i'm reading an article she wrote where she talks about how taking the heels back is always taking them down and how she don't believe in that. So I'm glad she discovered that. All right, so I want to take a break. It is 12.38. Um, I'll be back in about 10 minutes, okay? Okay.
All righty. Well, I'm back. Can you hear me? Anybody there? Must be alone. Hello. Hi, Linda. I can hear you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was feeling pretty lonely there. Let's see. Okay. Okay, well, I'm going to, uh, let's see. Uh, Simone, are you there? Or did you take a break? Fixing the kids' lunch or something. Okay, well, I'm going to, uh, there There was a gal uh, on the group, and she's been with us for quite a while, and uh, she took a wrong tune. And so we're going we're gonna to look at these feet. Now, what was interesting was, well, first let me let me show you the post. Hold on. Gotta get there. So to find Facebook. Computers working slow. Okay, so new share. Okay. Okay. So let's go down here. Wasn't that one? Oh, these dryers are not any good, by the way. They they won't last. You could use them. Can't press on them very hard. <clears throat> okay, so. Oh, here we go. It's Mary Burt, two days ago. And she said, and I, I told her we'd look at her horse's feet today. I'll show you what she said. I'll show you the pictures. I'll show you what I said. Excuse says, me, real quick, uh, um, Linda. Mm -hmm. Roger Leakey and a few others are trying to figure out how to join the meeting and the passcodes aren't working. Well, that's weird. Let me I look. Know, I sent them the thing from September when you redid it and she said that one's not working either. So I'm trying to figure out how to break her in. Okay, let me... Uh... Let me go to Zoom. I didn't mean to interrupt, but she's no, like- No, you're fine, you're fine, that's okay. Uh, let's see here. Just a second. Well. I showed her, I sent her the passcodes and everything from when you did the one in September where you had to resend it out. Okay. And she said that one came up as invalid as well. Okay. So I don't know who's in the meeting that can maybe break her in. I don't know who's with you. I wonder if meeting ID and passcode are the same. No, meeting ID is the actual meeting. The passcode is, I don't know why it's security, I guess. Okay. Um, let's see. Do Well. Isn't that weird? Yeah, I, who knows, you know? Um, so I'm trying to see if I can see the passcode while I'm in here and I'll let you go, but I'm just gonna see if I can find it and then send it to her. Sorry okay. for the interruption. Well, here, I'll just, just give it to you. All right, what is it? Uh, 352-538. Okay, now that's the passcode. Yeah. All right, what's the meeting ID? Do you have that? Uh. Oh, I got to go to the different one to find that in a second. Or it could be her internet. I don't know. She can try these. You want me to jump in? I have, I got the... I just send it in the chat. Okay. You can oh. copy it and, and forward it. Ah, Thank perfect. You. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> 
All right. Bye bye. Did I give you three five two five three eight? Yes. Okay. Uh, All right. So I joined. I joined with this link. I just posted in the chat here in the Zoom. So um, this should work. I mean, I got okay. here. So okay. <laughs> Thank okay, you. Great. Okay. Thank you. Bye. I'll get off. Bye. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I'm going back here and read what Mary Burt said. She said, here are some collages of my mare's right hind. Her name is Bibi. She is a 12-year-old Cameroon horse. She was born in France, Cameroon, and lived there until the age of six. Was brought to Germany in June of 2017 and came to be in November of 2017. In May 2019, she was diagnosed with laminitis. July 2020 was the last time I let a professional trimmer touch her feet and was lucky enough to find Linda intact in September of 2020. Her heels have been trimmed out badly for a long time. Okay, any comments will be appreciated and I will be happy to answer questions. I could post the other three feet like this separately if desired. I would like to see those. I thought these hooves, I thought these hooves do not and will never grow in height for years, no matter what I have tried to apply. But when I look at them like that now while watching the latest hoof chat, I can see improvements. I hope I am right. And she, she probably does have improvements from where she started. But you can have improvements, but then... Uh, you're just not seeing a couple things and these hooves are just grow beyond they'll just do a distortion on you before you even know it. it says all your ideas and comments and insights are welcome and taken into consideration thank you all my goal is to learn more and more and make my mare more comfortable with tact and help her as good as i can okay so then i looked at the feet and i'm going to show you what i said Okay, I said, after I looked at them, I said, well, I hate to say, but you have had some difficulty with these feet and they have taken a wrong turn. I think a lot of it is not knowing how to remove and manage sole, as well as I can see you need some help with dealing on uh, how to work with horn tubules, run forward horn tubules and how to keep them back. I just see a lot of details <clears throat> that are hard to get a handle on happening in your trim that is leading to hoof distortion. And I am sorry that I've not been able to help you enough. So let's make getting your understanding of some of these things better so we can reverse what has taken place. Now, after I said that, she private messaged, messaged, bleh, messaged me and apologized for doing this post. I, I said, you don't, she goes, do you want me to take it down? I went, no. I said, we don't hide things here. Okay. We're not of those who are going to hide our failures. We're going to look them straight in the face and figure out what went wrong and go back to the drawing board and try and figure out what we need to do to make it right. Um, so I said, no. Not at all, because this stuff happens to people, it happens to me. Uh, this is not easy, what y'all are doing. So let's look at the feet. Let's look at, take a look at her girl here. Oh, she got three white horses. Well, where is the thing? Why am I not? Oh, wait a second. Close it up. Okay. Just going to close that. Okay. Now, there's something you guys got to pay attention to, which is when you start to see a frog that is bent right here. Here, let me uh, save the image. Let's see.
and then reshare. So when you see, well, first of all, if you see bulbs that are still down here, the back of your foot is still pulled, still pulled down. This area here should be up here. This area where, which would be the, the top between the bulbs should be up here. But see, all this is fat, and very movable, can be pulled down. In fact, the cartilages can be pulled down a certain degree, but this area in between where the digital cushion is, you know, the cartilage is only, it's narrow and digital cushion fills this area up and fills that area. But this area in here, it's just fat and it can easily be pulled and forced down to here when these bulbs here are supposed to be clear up here. And then this little area here, clear up here. So we know that this anatomy is pulled down and under. Well, there was something there when it started pushing. It was this part of the center of the frog right here. And so as this was pulled down and under, that got pushed up in. Just like if you, you take and you, you bend a straw. What happens to the center of the straw? It goes up, right? Well, this area, you see how it's sucked in there? That is, uh, that's the bend in the foot. And so, you know, you could look at this at first and some might think it was kosher, but then when you see how low this hairline is, even though it's, it's straight, fair, well, kind of straight, it's still way pulled down because cartilages aren't supposed to go like that. All right, so you can see that in the collateral grooves, look how deep it is. And that's because the foot is bent. Like on my pony who's got bound feet, it's real easy to let the frog grow up and be flat here. Like here you're thin and you see the bend. But you can so trim these frogs that this frog could look totally flat and you wouldn't see the bend at all. And because the bend would be filled up with frog. And so when the foot is bent, you got these real deep collateral grooves and you got this frog bent up into the foot and uh, a lot of frog too, from the look of it, bent up into there. Well, then as that grows and it just, it can even look like a normal frog and this area fills up. Well, what is that going to do? Can anybody tell me if this all fills up with frog? Well, I think it's going to bond the foot. Oh, yes, you're right. <laughs> I'll just talk to myself. Okay, it's going to bind and glue the foot right where it's at is what's going to happen. Because this frog that grows in here is just going to look flat. But in truth, there's going to be a bend. And, and that foot that foot ain't going nowhere. And this is probably part of the problem she's having, too, is that this frog, has, you can tell it's a thick frog. It's deep in, in right here in the apex. But then it's bent down like that and up. See the bend? See the bend? Yeah. Okay. So, Linda, Mar Marion... Uh did it to the jet so mari is uh online right now you can or oh, she can good. talk maybe okay can yeah, you hear the me link. is she there i see her over here i see her so i'm working on this one foot of my pony because you know i had a had a, a reversal i had a reversal on my pony I mean, I was doing good last year. Her feet were coming unbound. It was beautiful. And then I just didn't support the foot up where it should be for a few days. And it was right back to where we started. And so, and now it's been even harder to get the feet to expand and unbind. But anyway, 
I never did work on uh, the back feet that much. I was just trying to unbind the front feet. It was the back feet, the cotton bone, everything didn't have no uh, no wearing away, no distortion, no demineralization, whatever you want to call it. Um, but the front feet did. So I was really working on the front feet. So I had started working on the back feet. And I started trimming the frog. And it got so deep. The collateral groove was so deep. Now the frog looked flat, like a frog looks usually. But the more I trimmed it, I trimmed so much out of the center of the frog and way down deep in the collateral grooves like that. So much frog that is binding the bulbs and keeping them from expanding. And so you, that's what you have going on here. Just having a hard time trimming these bars because in reality, um, this is overgrown bar that, it, well, the bar is bent as well. That's why it's so deep here in the collateral grooves. So let me do an annotate here with, well, darn, I don't have gray. Okay, so, so the foot is bent, all, all this is pulled down and under. And so the foot that should be, this is the inner foot that should be kind of like that. Instead, it's like, like this. And <clears throat> so originally, you would add a frog that was like this. But now you have a frog that is bent up into the foot like this. And so, but this happens all gradually. And the frog growth just fills in like this. So this whole piece of frog here is not the sh true shape of how the frog cram has been uh, bent up in the foot. And so this, you could have a big chunk of frog up in here that is years old even. Um, um, let me show you a picture of that. Hold on here a second. Sorry, Linda. I yeah. mean, I mean. Oh, good. Thank you, hey, Janet. hallelujah. Good. <laughs> I don't know what's going on with how my internet and my handy, my phone. I think it's Zoom. But I miss you guys and I wanted to be in. Thank you. I'm glad Thank you, you're Janet. here. I'm glad that worked out. Hello, you everybody. Know. Hi. Hi. This is Marian. Hi, Marian. <laughs> and the same happened to me, Angeliki, and uh, Simone helped me. So I, I can join now on Zoom. <laughs> Thank That's you, Simone. Awesome. I'm glad you're here because, you know, we're looking at your horse here. Yeah, I, I, I saw it already on YouTube, but Zoom is okay. much better. Okay, great. Well, I'm glad you're here. So that way you can be here firsthand and answer questions. And Sorry for the interruption, talking. Linda. Oh, the, don't worry about it. No problem. Thank no, you. No problem at all. And if you're, if anybody is writing me messages, I'm just not seeing them. I'm not ignoring you. Okay. But I, I just uh, get into this and I'm not looking at Facebook messages and stuff. I don't even know what's going on. So... Anyway, I'm glad that you were able to get a hold of somebody and get in here and uh, you're here now. Okay. So, so, <laughs> okay, so, let me, so, so suck your toe. Okay, let's see. <laughs> that was a saying when I was in school, in grade school. So anyway. You're talking about a green, a, a big chunk of... Yeah, this chunk of frog, okay, gets gets bent way up here into the foot. See how this is pulled down, down here. It's supposed to be up here. See, that's supposed to be up here. 
So if this gets bent down, well, then all the anatomy that was in front of it gets bent up like that internally. And so the frog that would have grown like this, you know, well, would have been like so. Okay, it just gets bent up into the foot like so slowly over time and you can see it right here right here this bend in the foot and another sign of it is a deep collateral groove right here very deep collateral groove and so i was going to show you that so just a minute here uh i'm lost I've lost the annotate thing. Oh, there you are, hiding behind everybody's picture. Hold on. Clear all drawings. All right. So we'll go find this picture to show you a piece of frog, dead frog stuck up in a horse's hoof where the whole back of the foot has been pulled down like that. Um, and see, this would be part of the problem is um, uh, the soul that I was telling you about because that soul will collect and collect collect in the toe. But primarily what I'm seeing here, uh, part of the problem was the back of your foot never truly released. Um, so you're gonna have to work and practice at trimming the frogs up better so that, because see, once the frog grows like that, it holds, binds the foot right there. Then we wind up trimming to the distortion of the frog instead of taking that frog down to where it can expand and stretch back out and the foot can relax and unbend and the back of the foot can move up so let's see here see if i can find this picture pictures uh -oh. oh yeah okay h i inner foot let's see if i got it there oh no it'd be under plastinization just a second i spent time arranging pictures yesterday i should be able to find them faster now e e f l m n o p plastinization hoof Okay, now I just have to find that one. I suppose it's not going to be. Oh, here we go. Okay. Oh boy, people and their copyrights. Um, like people, you did not. You did. You did not. Uh, make this hoof. Van Horst did. Let's see. Okay, I'm going to share. Da, 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 da. new share okay see this this uh sagittal slice okay so this is this that you can't even see any frog this is all periopal grown over the frog but you see this right here that is a piece of frog right there old dead frog that's totally covered up and look at how how painful would that be pushing up against the navicular bone and the deep digital flexor tendon. And you see this, you know, this, this is that digital cushion. I was just showing about how your digital cushion on your horse is pulled down like this, not as bad as this horse, but, but quite a bit. I mean, they'd have thought this was just the greatest horse because look at the hairline. It's clear on the ground. Look, he's walking on his bulbs down here. Okay, so let's go back. Okay, so again, um, so this frog is holding the frog in the bars. See, the bars really have to be trimmed down a lot. And because they're just, those, these are just grown up distorted bars and they're very deep in the foot. Um, so the frogs have to start being really, really trimmed and 
you're going to find that this area of frog is going to be deep, deep like that. But you have to get this frog trimmed down um, in order for the back of this foot to start coming up. Now, Linda, yeah, can I, this is the picture from when I until this time I didn't touch her feet. And this is an old picture. Oh, okay. Well, I, I sent other pictures what it looks like now. Oh, okay. The foot. Yeah. Okay. Well, see now how good it's your it's good you're here. But nevertheless, what I'm describing here is accurate and what would have had been done to this horse. Like, okay, yeah. like I should look at this and kind of guess that with all the rasp marks on the wall. Yeah. Because that's a farrier thing, right? You know. So, okay, so we're looking at the foot, how it started and what it would have needed, but let's keep looking at it so we know where she started from. And of course, now remember I said this is very deep in here, right? So you can see how deep the collateral groove is. Okay. All right. So this is a trim when the farrier was still doing it. Did you have a farrier or a barefoot trimmer? Um, this person called himself hoof orthopedist, and he he never told me where he he learned his profession. Okay. And yeah. Well, that sounds like an equine podiatry to me. Yeah, I, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. That's what he. That's what it is. Because see, okay, so you got Casey Lapierre, who primarily started that, and I think was it Teskey? Can't remember. Might have been Teskey too. But anyway, um, so so Casey Lapierre is a farrier. So he adopted the barefoot doctrine along with his farrier doctrine. And so what they do is they do the basic barefoot trim, but they rasp down the dorsal wall like a farrier does. That's the kind of trim that they do. So so that's what was going on. And yeah, usually you got hoof wall breaking off in the toe and things like that all right so regardless of whether this is current or not what i'm telling you is what's going on with this foot at this time this was uh back in 2020 okay so now let's go on to the next we're gonna see the progression uh if i can get around move around in here Okay, we'll go back to here. Okay, so that's 2020. Okay, so you started, now was this your trim? That other one was in August. And so this was the next trim. And by George, had you started tack here? No, I, I just started uh, watching your videos in September. Okay. this year 2020 and i think one one time i had another hoof trimmer person and then i said no now i will try myself okay i think about in october 2020 i i trimmed her myself from october 2020 okay i just want to look at something see kind of huh See, I'm looking at this flap in the in the periopal, and that mm -hmm. tells me that uh, her cartilage is moved. I'm looking at them here. See, anytime you come and you see these flaps, they're either there because you're growing some heel in, or you're trimming some heel out. Yeah. Um. Okay, so that gal didn't trim off. I mean, she trimmed off a little bar, but. Oh, and let's look at, see, always looking at the cartilages too. Look how much more bound. Of course, little, maybe a little different angle, but still, this cartilage seems to be more bound than that one, as it was here as well. Yeah. And. And so now this is July 21. 
and you were, you were trimming by this time. Yes. And Okay. And so what I wanted, what I saw in this wood here was that the soul got away from you. Yeah. You, you see what I mean? So I'm going to show you a video of a gal taking soul um, out of the foot. And this is a gal um, that believes a lot like we do and is growing heels on horses. At least she does now. I don't know if she did, uh, you know, a few years ago, but I'm glad she's doing what she's doing. She's got a very nice web page with good articles. So I'm going to show that to you. Um, but again, many people, you have to uh, engage with people with with a discerning uh, attitude, okay? Uh, because many people still hold on to many of the mistakes that are inferior, even though they may be doing good in one area, like uh, they grow heels, but they may not know about the frogs that you need to uh, grow those frogs. They might not, not know about different areas. And so anywhere where you don't have the truth, you're going to uh, wind up that foot's going to get away from you. Okay, so, and I was so much, um, I, I had so much to do with her fronts because she was diagnosed laminitis. Mm -hmm. And so I always focused on the fronts and the, the hinds. I thought when the fronts are better, then I will <laughs> yeah. look after the hinds. I, and yeah. Yeah, I did the same thing so, for years. Yeah. You know? I just hope the hinds would take care of themselves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and these you know, heels just don't grow. She walks it off and yeah. 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 Well, and, and because see, they're pulled under too. Yeah, the back they, of the foot yeah. is pulled under and you can see from the growth rings as well. And like, I, yeah, it was the same for me. Everything you're going through, I, I've gone through, probably go through it again, you know. Yeah. Um, stuff gets away from us but now see now i trim all the feet the same hmm. i mean not the same and yes they each have a different issues going on and stuff like that but that you trim the back feet the way, same way you do the front except like in the sides of the toe you you want to bring the sides of the toe quarters down more since uh like if you look here okay this minute. Let me save this image and work it. New share. Okay, so if you look here, you can see that uh, you have left this area high and long. See right there? Yeah, I can see it, yes. Okay. So, so let's see. Oh, and you see it here too. See? Yeah. Yep, so you can take all this right down to the level of the soul. Uh, even more off the side. But then take your pictures and look and then go back and tweak your trim. Uh, Linda, I thought I, I looked at the this hairline. This is 21. I yeah oh oh yeah you looked up here, and, and it, I... it's go, it's going down on the uh, lateral side yeah. so i thought i cannot take it down more oh the hairline no, uh, no, no. uh what you just to told me to take down um the, well, the wall here yes yeah yeah there yeah yeah um i mean it's down the wall is not pushing up instead what the wall is doing is it's starting to flare yeah yeah, because when you leave it high, okay, um, then it, it's going to take the path of least resistance. And so instead of just jamming up here, um, it's flaring out. Flare. Oh, I see. Yes. See, a little bit at a time. Yeah. And it'll also grow forward like this. See? Yeah. Yeah. How it's, how it's grown forward. So it's flaring out. And this, this is also, like, this is from 21, but we still want to examine all these pictures, okay? Mm -hmm. And so this is flaring out, but it's also growing forward. 
See, because the whole hoof wall grows down and forward. So if you leave it long in the toe quarters, it's going to pull forward. Well, then it's just going to pull the back of the foot with it. See? Okay, so um, now this is still better. Notice that, um, well, the collateral grooves don't look quite as deep. Maybe they are. Um, you're still pulled down pretty good down here, but this was like 21. Let's go and look at the next one. Hold on. Ah. New share. Okay. Oh, it's not wanting to. There we go. Okay, so this is now, now we're in August. Okay. Now it looks like here you did get your toe to back up some. But in the meanwhile, um, this part back here, let me copy that again. Save image. Okay, so in the in the other one, what we saw was all of this, uh, the toe was really being pushed forward, but it looks like you got more of a handle on the toe. But this piece of, of uh, hoof wall that had grown forward with the toe. I think you have to uh, share the new oh, picture. Oh, sorry. The, new no share. There we go. So the horn tubules, you know, they're supposed to be in alignment, like the longest is in the center of the toe, and then they gradually reduce in length as they go back to the heel buttress, and they should all be at the same angle, and the heel area from here to here, like your heel's here, but it should be up here, yeah. see? And so what happened was, when all that toe and everything got pulled forward, it pulled this part forward as well, and it all grew. And so you got this number going on now. Just a second here. Uh, annotate. Get a different color. Might as well do and that. Okay, so so uh, you, you the toe is backed up more here. Mm -hmm. But see this part? Yeah. See that part? That's the part we got to get straightened around. Yeah. Okay. And so you're going to want to come in here and you see how these, uh, where are they here? You see how your, your growth rings down like this? So, but, uh, so basically, his bulb down here needs to be up here. And so, we've got to work on getting this to all shorten and to start backing up. And to just do that, uh, just a minute here and clear all drawing. Okay, to do that, you don't want to come in here and take, you don't want to cut all the heel off, okay, but you want to come in here and at least take this off in here. Um, <clears throat> we're going to endeavor to keep growing this, but we're going to put a notch here and come over like this so that these horn tubules will want to uh drop down and push back but you got to keep growing this part let's um just a minute here clear let's look at the rest of the foot okay so let's look at the soul study the soul now your bars are looking better 
and you are trimming up your frog, but I would be very interested to know just how thick that frog is right in here. But um, what you want to do, let's look at a view of the heels. Okay, so this little area here is gonna be what you're wanting to, to grow. Well, and from here, yes. all of this, you know, but you're gonna have to work with the front of them horn tubules to get them to want to see how they go like that. Yeah. To get them in order to be able to come back, the foot wants to be back here. Yeah. So it's gonna be helping you the whole time because there is constant pressure of a pull this way. So if you will start giving this room, come up to here, let me uh, do a annotate. Okay. Um, let's see here. We can find one of these growth things here, just somewhere right in here. And, you know, for that matter, you could probably just bevel that whole thing there. Level and bevel that. And uh, some of these will start to drop down and back. Okay, I will do that. Okay. Um, On on the uh, Linda, I have a question. Okay. On the medial side, I thought I saw an improvement because I thought the hairline was straighter and it stretched a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, the med medial side is better. Yeah. Look okay. at the horn tube. Look least, at this yeah. area right here. It Still is not... forward, but let's see here. Like here's this area. There's that horn tubule right there. Yeah. And then you got this, it stands up more, this mm. side. See? Now eventually, uh, you're gonna want this bulb to come up and this will fill in with soul. Right now this bulb is sticking out. Your your actual uh let me see here. Clear. The actual heel buttress, what little is there, is mm. under here. Let me draw. Yeah. Do. Okay, is under back under here, about up to there. That's just kind of how this capsule is going. And most of this is bulb and periopal skin. And so the way it's supposed to be is. This bulb is only supposed to be about that wide. Yeah. And your heel buttress is supposed to be up like this. And so you see all this area here? Mm -hmm. All this wall has to fill all that in. Yeah. See? Well, it'd be clear up here. Except for back here, that's where your heel buttress is. And it connects right here. And so all this wall is going to fill all this in here. And then this horn tubule that uh, is going right here, you can see it. Yes. Okay. That's going to have to back up. Just a minute here. I remember you saying... Um, it's like watching grass grow, growing. It takes so much time and you wish yeah. you could pull on it yes. to make it grow. <laughs> okay, see there how that's, yeah. those horn tubules are supposed to be. These ones here will shorten up. Yeah. You know, they will all come in like so. That's where they want to be. So you're you're kind of leaving this high so mm -hmm. the growth will push up and, and stay in here, but you've got to take out um, some of this here to give these tubules room to move. I see. And see this whole piece here, totally different than that side there. Yeah. Which happened on me too. One side trimmed out more, run forward or whatever more, you know, see oh. this is a big old chunk of hoof in there that's only supposed to be like this size. 
Yeah. See? Not like all this lame. I saw that this happened, but I did not know what to do to make it. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I can relate. Listen, yeah. look, and we also have to look at your frog again. Let's see. See. Okay. So you're going to want to clean all this, clean this up in between here and start forming a central sulcus in here. Okay. Okay. And just, uh, yeah, see, and I can see why you have trouble here because you don't have any connection. So yep. you're, you're like taking it down, but then you're afraid to take it down anymore um, because of the lack of connection here. Yes. Um, but this this could be beveled clear over to the white line even if there's even if there is a uh a hook here in the heel um see okay. what one thing we're trying to do is trying to figure out how to trim these feet kind of like these wild horses trim themselves uh i want to just show you something here hold on I'm, I've just really been paying attention to that. How do these feet trim themselves? There's a meaning behind this for why they do what they do um, mm -hmm. that helps them correct themselves. Uh, just a minute here. Let me find some pictures. And... And, huh, let's see, the O, <laughs> oh, because I'm in the wrong spot, okay, maybe, maybe not, E-F-T-H-I-J-K-L, um and now why would this happen why would i why would i lose a folder that particular folder linda yeah in this point i want to confirm you once again because my mares that live out 24 7 uh-huh Whenever they self trim, they get they they just um, crush a little bit of that precise point of the wall, and after a couple of days, it's the the, the hoof is uh, round and uh, uh, whole again. Uh huh. They just crush this small uh, round uh, roundish uh, piece yes piece of uh, of wall exactly at the same spot you are uh, showing okay and yeah. then the hoof is back normal again after a week let's say exactly at the at the place you are showing now i found one that's doing that. Wait. But I, I, I didn't make any okay. photo. See, that's I'm good. Stupid. Well, here I found a good one. Just a minute. Um, where are we at here? Remote. Let's see. I want to go on with this. Make sure uh, what the pictures are. Just a second here. Uh, well, I'll show you this one. I just, I just happened upon this. Like that? <laughs> That's actually yes, not bad exactly, at all. Exactly at the same point. Exactly at the same spot. Yeah, I mean, uh, sooner or later, it's going to break that toe off. But see how, you can see how that almost becomes a bulldozer. Like digging in the dirt, the dirt would be pushing up that and pushing the heel back. See, man, I got one of them sticky flies. You know, the kind that, 
like to attach themselves to your face and then you hit hit at it and you slap yourself anybody else do that besides me <laughs> okay i slap some sense into myself okay um oops okay i'm gonna find this other these other pictures hold on okay just a second god hear that that's me smacking myself I hate them little flies. Um, da -dum -dum -dum. okay, just a minute. Well, I'll get one of those started anyway. And then here, I'll put you on this one while I'm looking for the other picture. Uh, no, I'm gonna smack myself. Let's see. Okay. Don't smack yourself because we need you home. <laughs> I was sitting there yesterday slapping myself, trying to get a fly. Let's see. Uh, where is it? Okay. Okay. So this is the first picture I have ever seen of Gene Ovenek's research. And I found it on, it's 12 years old. I found it on something called YouTube, Hoof Care TV. And uh, he he has a series on there, and he just happened to show some of his photos. Uh, so that was awesome. So um, now let me go find this other deal of his. Just a second here. Okay. Okay. Now I can share. Let's see. New share. Okay. So again, uh, it should be required reading. If you want to understand what is going on with these feet, some of this stuff you that these people have written, it's really important to understand their research. Um, uh, so, so he's showing here the different kinds of feet he did these experiments on. And, um, let's look at his pictures first. Let me, let me show you those. Let's see, new share. Okay. Okay. So, uh, now in his research he talks about how they took a board let's see ah well look at this one okay so here's this picture here now uh look at this foot here that he drew from that just a second uh okay so that would have been one of these here see that he drew um and look it's got that that space so the more their heels have been pulled forward the more uh well the more hollow because the foot is bent so if the foot is bent right here there's not a tight white line connection so it breaks out easy that's that's what's going on there and so uh our new share go back to his okay so he took the angles and he had a board imprint that he did there's a picture of that here see the black paint on it that's from he painted a board with black paint and then then he put the the foot against the board there's a picture of him showing it and then he took angles and he numbered them all yeah, he did like maybe 67 horses all together. He had 30 some one year, 30 some the next, something like that. It it kind of talks about it in his research. And then I found an article where he talked about it too. Um, so definitely this horse here had more than one centimeter heel, right? Huh? 
That's more than one centimeter, right? We can tell yes. because look, it's got a measuring thing on it. This is a hoof gauge, the kind that also measures the length of the dorsal wall. Now, again, if we were to go back to that page I just show you where he drew, how could he do that? Because he had these pictures. Oops, I'm doing the wrong thing. Oh. Number eight. And so in his description, he talks about how, you know, you've heard of the four point tram. Well, that was copied off of his research. And uh, it's because when they put a board on it, a lot of times you'd see a point here, 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 and here on the sides. That's he started, somebody started calling the toe quarters, toe pillars off of this. This is uh, perfectly uh, just adds up with his interpretation of research. Now, here you go. There's the horse's feet. Pretty good size feet, too, aren't they? There's the board he was using. Okay, that's my ham. <laughs> See, this was really thrilling for me to finally see these feet. You know, after reading that article forever. Let me show you that article. Let's go to that article real quick here. Just a second. Hold on. Um, do, 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 do. Got to find Facebook again. Okay, so let's see, new share, new share, uh, I guess I'm here. So the article is Wild Horse Hoof Pattern Offers Hope for Domestic Horses. Okay, uh, 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 right here. No, is that it? Yeah, that's it. Okay, so this is the article. And he just gives a description. Now, it's interesting in here that he is also leery, leery of giving his findings. Because you also find out that he was persecuted for having other ideas. Now, isn't that interesting? You see, if it's a truth, it's just a truth. When it's a lie, you got to defend it by being nasty. See? Okay. So anyway, um, this is the basics of what he saw from the external markings and view. And so the, he came up with his interpretation of all this, which I don't agree with a lot of his interpretations. And I can prove um, that what he thinks he saw might not quite be the case. But anyway, so he gives the different feet from the different kinds of environments. Um, he gives the average toe lengths and he gives the uh, like, um, from two and five eighths to three and one fourth inches um, on these different horses. He says, although the length, now he never tell, gives you any length of heel at all. He just says this, although the length of heel varied greatly between environments, the functional hoof angle was very similar. The functional hoof angle is defined as the angle formed between the dorsal hoof wall and the ground surface. We saw him, the gauge that he placed on all these feet. Um, da, 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 da. During weight bearing, soil and organic material pack the solar surface of the foot may play an important role in weight distribution. Uh, portions of the foot, especially the posterior two thirds of the hoof. Now, 
I've read this over and over, over the years, the last 18 years. Um, well, I don't know, might not have been, uh, I don't know if it was on the net when I first started trimming, but I started trimming with his trim. He had directions on the internet. Uh, I may not have found this till a couple years later or something, but I've read it over and over. And as I have done so, uh, because my under chat, this is what you got to know. Don't think just because you go and read something once that you know it and you've read it and that's all there is to it. As you learn and you grow and you develop in your knowledge and understanding and you go back and read something, you will see more things that you didn't comprehend or see before. Like the way I read this now, my understanding of what he's talking about now is way a lot different than it was originally, other than the things that really stuck with me here were uh, the dorsal wall length. And so I had to research to figure out why that was so. And of course, that took taking the hoof capsules off and measuring the feet, you know, to find out they're like two and a half inches. So it would make sense. You want at least three inches. Uh, they're, they're anywhere like internally the, the, from the coronary band to the end of the internal toe. Uh, I can't remember exactly, but like, uh, two and, uh, a half, sometimes a little less. Some of them might be just a tad longer, but this tells you why you need at least th usually a three inch, three inch dorsal wall on your average size horse so so he goes through all of his well first of all okay look at this with how he starts with the best intentions in mind okay many owners and trainers dictate hoof length angle measurements shoe types weights with limited knowledge of the side effects they may cause do you know, uh, yeah, he, what about heel length? See, same thing, right? Okay, so anyway, uh, what's interesting is down here, he goes through his research, what he did, everything like that. Um, and then he has this, oh, change of thought. Hmm. He says, putting into practice the information I had gathered what does that say? Required a major shift in thinking. Why is that? Well, here, the idea, the idea. See, you find these farriers are afraid to get ideas that are different than their peers. The idea that the soul, bars, and frog might play a major role in the support of P3, the coffin bone, and now here, instead of occupying a suspended state, seems scary, but almost refreshing. Now, doesn't it seem weird that people would talk like that? Like that it would be that big of a deal that you would have to think about it that way? That's because, see, that's one of their mistakes that they made. Um, what they've been teaching for centuries is that the coffin bone is magically suspended within the hoof by the lamina and that the lamina are what bear the weight of the horse. Do, do you comprehend what I'm saying here? Who here knows what the lamina is? Skin. Huh? Skin. Yeah. yeah. Skin yeah. on the inside of the hoof, right? The, well, okay, there's two laminas, right? There's the one on the hoof capsule wall, internal wall, and there's the one on the wall mm -hmm. of the foot. And it, you're right, it's skin. Well, and it connects to the one lamina connects the other. Okay, so they taught for centuries that this is what bears the weight of your horse. And this is what gives him his spring in his step. Now, are you comprehending what I'm saying here? That is why 
farriers would pare out the sole, set the foot on a shoe so that the wall alone was bearing the weight. Not because the wall, not because they believe the wall bears the weight, but because they believe the internal sensitive tissues bear the weight. Like how freaking backwards and stupid is that? Like, unless we were freaking brainwashed from yeah. the get-go to believe that, we as normal people would never even imagine something so stupid and bizarre as that. See? And this is a major thing within barriery. And where did this come from? Well... I don't, I'm not sure who exactly started it, but I know who perpetuated it in perpetuity. That was Professor Coleman, the guy that was uh, in charge of the Royal Veterinary College in London for 38 years. Somebody who never shot a horse, who wrote a book on how to shoe a horse, and wrote a book on their anatomy. And that has carried on. Well, when was that? That was in 1820. He wrote that book somewhere around then. And it's just continued on for the next several hundred years. You know, so here you have a guy, heck of a good guy, Gene Omenick, too. Um, I lost my place. Uh, what happened? I guess I got to open it again. There we go. Here you have a guy that it, he says it's scary to think this. Like he's feeling like a heretic. Going to be burned at the stake. Um, change of thought. Putting into practice the information I had gathered required a major shift in thinking. That's when you know you're indoctrinated and brainwashed. When you're afraid to think anything different. That's when you know it's become more of a religion than it is a science. Um, putting into practice the information I had gathered that the soul, bars, and frog might, might, okay, look, don't kill the messenger, might play a major role in support of P3, the coffin bone. Instead, instead, instead of occupying a suspended state seemed scary, but almost refreshing. Is that, don't you think that's a little insane? That, that a, a farrier has to feel that way over some bunch of garbage that he's been taught. See? Um, See, he says, it has been common a common practice. We're talking about mistakes. Mistakes that have been killing horses and people for centuries. It has been common practice for farriers to remove, sculpture, and minimize these areas of the foot. Doing so suggests that the wall bears the burden of total support of P3. Well, except that's not, you know, I don't know if he knew it, all right, but it, they don't, that isn't the belief that the wall bears the weight. You put the weight on the wall to transfer it to the lamina, see, because they believe that horse is magically suspended by the lamina in the foot. He says, fortunately, there are many farriers who look differently on these uh, structures and tread lightly with the hoof knife. Those who understand the importance of natural foot structure have decided that those features look just fine uh, the way they were intended. It is refreshing to know that whosoever, this is what I love about him. Okay, he's not going to take you off into evolution land. Now, you want to believe that? Be my guest. Um, he says, it is refreshing to know that whomsoever designed the hoof 
did not make these parts by mistake after all. Now, regardless of what you believe about how we got here, okay, the part, the, the thing is the fact that the hoof care world and the farriers and the vets, okay, um, have people thinking this. Well, must have made a mistake making all these parts on the bottom of the foot since the bottom of the foot don't bear the weight of the horse. And the horse is the only animal on God's green earth that doesn't bear its weight on the bottom of the foot somehow, some way. It's magically suspended in a state of suspended animation within the foot on the sensitive tissues. That's what they believe. That's what they teach now, 270 years of it. Yeah, and Linda, in German, they use a word. It's called Hufbeinträger. Maybe huh. you can. It's like coffin bone carrier, but they cannot describe what it is or what it looks like. And and yes, I, I never understood what what do they mean with Hufbeinträger? What can carry a, a coffin bone inside the hoof? Not the lamina, but they tell you that. Wow. Well, wow, it's, it's really strange. Interesting. Yeah, it, it is strange, isn't it? Well, see now, were you here? Who was who was just talking? Was that you, Marion? Yes, it was okay. me. Okay. Now, were you here when I explained about Henry Hammerling's uh, bibliography of all the people that have written about the hoof? Yeah, yeah, I was there on YouTube. Okay. Well, remember, lots of German writers. Several, yeah. uh, several hundred. Yes. <laughs> See? Um, so, well, that's really interesting. Thanks for that bit of information. And so um, he says, uh, da, 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 da. Well, where are we? yeah, it is refreshing to know that whosoever designed the hoof did not make these parts by mistake after all. The fact that the sole bars frog have a function, <gasps> it's amazing and possess the ability to respond rapidly to environmental changes suggests their present presence are very important for support. Like, wouldn't a normal person just think that? Wouldn't you? Didn't you always figure that your horse wore its weight on the bottom of the foot, that all them parts that you see when you pick the foot up and pick it out? Yep, yep, that's what's bearing weight, right? Isn't that what common sense would tell people? Till you get educated. And then you throw common sense in the toilet. It doesn't work anymore, especially in academics. Okay? Once they write something down, once one of those wannabe gods writes something down in a book and he has any position of power at all over the minds of others, it becomes like God himself wrote it in stone. Okay, and once it gets into the academic realm, okay, that lie is perpetuated. Well, look at this lie, it's been perpetuated for centuries. There you go. Yeah, so uh, let me find this here, just a second here. Da 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 da. YouTube. Yeah, the first time I found that out, I was incredulous. I wonder if that's a word. Is that a word? Incredulous? If not, it's a word I then a, then it's a word I make up. I thought it was incredible and I was flat amazed. You know, that's I was like gobsmacked that that anyone would believe that. You know, it just goes to show how easily we get sucked in by authorities, you know, in schools. That's why, that's why uh, people, whoever controls the school people, there you go. Uh, and, and that goes back to Plato and Socrates, okay? And the academy. You control what, how you educate people. You control what they think. You control the world. That's how it goes. So, okay, let me, I want to find this. Uh, okay, farrier forgery. Eh, 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 eh. 
well not for oh here it is here's my my video i did farrier forgery uh now oh oh am i not sharing okay no well i'm so selfish let's see new share okay there we go so Fer farrier forgery the devastating and diabolical truth of the lie they believe and practice. This is the very thing that Gina Obenick is talking about, that they are all taught. And it is like the Holy Grail. It might as well be the Trinity. You know, it might as well be, you know, uh, Muhammad, you know, with Allah. It might as well. I mean, it is so ingrained. It is like a religious dogma. Um, so, uh, when did I, okay, so I did this six years ago. I published this on April 8th, 2017. So this is one, uh, this is one of the most ridiculous. I could not believe it when I learned of it. Uh, that they actually believe this. So anyway, so you should probably watch this video. How long was it? It's about an hour and 15 minutes. And I go into two, um, how the vets and the farriers were in, uh, were in competition with one another. I'll show you this one thing. And I've got some jokes in there too. <laughs> so, talking feet. All right, so, all right, so anyway, um, so then he goes into, now, Jamie Jackson and Gene Obenick. Jamie Jackson says that he did wild horse hoof research from 1982 to 1986. Gene Obenick did wild horse research from in 86, in the year of 86 and 87. Um, I'm going to show you something here that might make you think a little bit. Um, just a second here. Do, 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 do. I can find it. And of course, I can't. Oh, here we go. Okay. Reshare. Okay, Zoom, where you at? There you go. Okay, new share. Here we go. Okay, so this is what Gene Ovenek came up with in his research. And I have shown you real pictures. Okay, um, I, I, I wish he would just publish all of his pictures online. You know, this fly is still attacking me. Okay, so now I want to show you something else. Here's Jamie Jackson's idea of wild horses pictures, wild horse hooves, what every hoof is like. Remember, Gene said uh, heel lengths vary. We saw pictures, just a minute here. We saw pictures, new share, of the heels of some of these horses. Ah, go away, fly. Let's look at them. That ain't no one centimeter, is it? Okay, the dorsal wall, he gave the length two and seven eighths to three and a fourth inches, right here. We know that this heel is not no one centimeter heel. <clears throat> what about this one? This one looks a little lower, but still, compared to the dorsal wall, that's still a good inch and a half. And this one, Look at that heel, see? So, go back. Now, let me go back here. Okay, I'm lost again. Okay, there's Zoom. New share. Okay, so here's Gene's research. Here is the research 
here are the results of the research that Jamie Jackson says he did. And he said, um, oh, did I write it down here or not? Just a minute, let me look. Okay, he said that all of the hooves that he examined had one centimeter heels. Now, what's interesting is that in his first book, he said that he, he's, he mentions it twice. First, he says that he was able to examine over 100 horses with BLM, Bureau of Land Management. That is who gathers these horses. He was able to uh, examine over 100 head of horses. Later in the book, he gives an exact number, 107. And it's the same, this is book came out in 1992. And it, then he had another edition come out in 1997 and it says the exact same thing. Then, now I gotta, I'm gonna have to look at the page. Hold on a second because I'll, I'll have to look at it. <clears throat> Let me put this on a different, di something different for you to look at just a minute so they can have a, a freaking hissy fit over whatever copyright or whatever. Um, You know what though? Their, their findings and their research needs to be researched to make sure that they did what they said they did and how they drew their conclusions. You know, how did they draw their conclusions? What led them to conclude that these feet were like this? Okay, now I'm just gonna ask you a question. I'm gonna go back to this. Are these, these two studies, these wild horse feet, are they the same? Do they gel with one another? No. They don't, do they? In your experience, do all horses have one centimeter heels? No. Yeah, one CM. Okay. Gene's drawings don't show that. He, now, again, he never measured heels. He just said heel lengths varied. Um, he says... He did measure them, and they're all one centimeter. In his first book, he says he worked with exactly 107 horses. Are you talking and, about now, Gene? On uh, Jackson. Yeah, okay, Jackson. Got yeah, it. Yeah, this one's Jackson. This one's Ovenick. Yeah, it's fly. Now... I got to go somewhere and look at something here real quick. So just hold on a second and keep this thought. Keep, keep looking at it. I'm just going to keep it up here uh, for you to look at and compare. All right. Now. Gotta to, got to look at something here for reference while I'm reading. Okay, he says on page 82 of his first edition of The Natural Horse, he said in the section on hoof sizes, heel lengths were found to be the same for virtually all hooves sampled. Okay, he says even toe lengths hardly varied. Now, what's interesting is Gene says toe lengths really did not vary that much, but heel lengths did seem to vary. That's what I found interesting. And if we looked at his uh, just a few samples, we were able to see none of them were one centimeter. Okay, now, just a second here. 
because I gotta read you this other thing here. Okay, just a second. So I make sure I'm getting uh, the additions. See, this book has been reprinted three times. Um, okay. Okay, so in, did I not? Okay, the 1992 introduction. He states, okay, I made arrangements with officials of the Bureau of Land Management, BLM, to conduct a thorough, thorough examination of the hooves of over 100 wild free roaming horses. 1997 edition, introduction. Um, where is it here? Uh, it's a little different, I think. Wait a minute, let me see. Nope, same exact thing. Before long. Shall, shall we see a new share picture? No, or? no I don't want to no, put okay. this up because I've taken okay. pictures out of the book. Okay. I don't mind okay. putting that one up, but see, you could get into a copyright thing here. All right, but I'll send it to you. All right, 1997 edition. He says, before long, I made arrangement with officials of the Bureau of Land Management, BLM, to conduct a thorough examination of the hooves of over 100 wild free roaming horses. Let's jump forward to 2020. The Natural Horse, the 2020 revised edition. Here he says, just a minute. Before long, I made arrangement with officials of the Bureau of Land Management, BLM, to conduct a thorough examination of the hooves of 250 wild free roaming horses. Well, what is it? Was it 107? Or was it 250? See, here he says- he doesn't, he doesn't state that he went back and did more, right? Nope, nope. He doesn't state nope. that he went back and continued working. Nope, nope, nope. Not at all. In fact, he states the very opposite. He'll tell you, I last left wild horse country in 1986. See, stuff like that. So here, okay, so- so now let's go to, so here, okay, here I have just shown you where in the introduction, he said that he made uh, arrangements with BLM uh, to examine the hooves of over 100 wild horses. He changes that not to be a, uh, he changes it from a general number to a specific number to 250. And then, Come on, you stupid thing. Okay, and then uh, what page is this? In chapter four, that was the introduction. In chapter four, uh, the natural horse and its hooves, he states this. My observations are based on 107 wild horses. So, you know, in the introduction, he says, I made arrangements to... Uh, Examine, thoroughly examine over 100. By chapter four, he tells us the exact number, 107. I examined at the Litchfield Corrals in Northern California. 1997 edition, the same exact thing, 107 horses. Now we get to the 2020 version where in the introduction, where he first said, he made arrangements to look at, study the hooves of over 100 wild horses. He changed it to, I studied 250. Okay. Now here in that same edition, he says this. He says, my observation are based on wild horses. He removes the 107. Period. Again, 1992 
1997, he says, my observations are based on 107 wild horses I examined. 2020 edition, he says, my observations are based on wild horses. He removed the 107. So what's all that about? And here's something else that's interesting. You get that first book and you count all the pictures and you look at all the pictures and hardly any of them are his. And in fact, he lists the whole thing. Yet he spent four years observing wild horses. Why didn't he take any pictures hardly? Why did he have to use everybody else's pictures? Why was there not one single picture of him doing any measuring of any feet at all? Why? Um, none. All there is is the picture of that one dead wild horse's foot uh, that he got from BLM. They gave him the, the feet off a dead horse. And that's the, the feet he carts around to every clinic. And that's the feet that he used to make this model here that you're looking at. Okay, watch here. I wanna show you something. So we're gonna look at these two feet. See, mistakes, they make mistakes. Hmm, mistakes, huh? Okay, so he made some mistakes, man, in his research from what I see. First of all, he forgot that he did 250, obviously, because he had to change it later. And plus, he says he took pictures of every single one. Okay. Um, but it is not until a later book that you see a kind of a fuzzy, bad picture of two feet uh, roped together. And he says, I took pictures of all the, the feet. In another book, he says he studied over a thousand feet. See? What the heck's going on here? So, just a minute here. Uh, okay, you see these feet? Okay. Yep. Okay, so these are off the dead wild horse that he was given, that he takes to every clinic. These are, this foot here is the rear. This is the one that is used most. You don't hardly ever see this foot here. Okay, look at this foot. now. We've been doing markups, right? And we've been measuring the dorsal walls. We measure in the center to see how long. And then we go over two inches. We measure here because, you know, we're trying to get the foot to be the, the capsule, be the true shape of the foot, growth rings, the whole shebang. So we're looking at cartilages all the time. We're looking at heel lengths all the time, right? So if we look at this, look, he put that here, not me. What's that say? Right there. Can somebody read that? Can you see it? Well, okay, I'll heel answer length, it. Heel length angle. Right. So he marked that. This is in his book. We already know that he says the dorsal walls were three inches. On occasion, three and a fourth. So three inch dorsal wall. So I take and I divide that up into threes, and then I measure that. About how long are you going to say that heel, even though it's under run, is how long would you say that heel is? About one. One and a half inches. At, at a minimum, right? Okay. Now look here. Here's the hind foot. But, you know, you don't notice as much in the hind foot that the heel is, is run forward in the same kind of way. Like here, you kind of see it looks funky, you know, the, just the way and the horn tubules and everything. Here in the back foot, he marks the heel. He marks the dorsal wall, three inches. So how long is that heel? Well, 
it's almost half the length, an inch and a half at least, right? So how does this example go from having heels, see, having heels that are at least at a minimum two and a half inch, or not two and a half inches, an inch and a half, how do you go from that to saying that every hoof you studied had a heel, the horse had heels that were only one CM? And how do you go from this to, let's go back to here, to saying this is the foot every horse should have? Okay. What if this is the foot every horse should have? And you're trying to transition them to a foot they were never meant to have to begin with because even his own specimens don't have that heel on him. Am I wrong? Is it frightening? Are you scared? Is it scary to think? I bet I can see all the barefooters out there. <gasps> it's scary to think that my bulb shouldn't be on the ground. Yeah, see, Not, it, it 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 doesn't scares me. But uh, I know a bar a bar hoof trimmer. Uh, mm -hmm. She's very kind and yeah. pretty nice. And but she asked me every time. Do the bulbs doesn't need contact to the ground? And I said, yes, they don't need contact to the ground. Okay, I don't can't believe that. For you, and I said, yeah. And I said, never, never bulb contact or uh, frog contact on the ground. Never. Yeah. 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 And she she's twisted, twisting, twisting right now. So um, yeah, pretty hopefully that uh she comes uh, over to the tact. I, I sure hope so. But you see how yeah. they're programmed with Pardon? these teachings? You see how yeah. the farriers were programmed with these teachings? Mm -hmm. and, and this frog contact, this was not new to barefoot. Okay. So so uh, Jamie Jackson, he was, he, he was a hack. Do you know what a hack is? A hack is somebody, that's what a farrier would call somebody who wasn't trained in a farrier school. Okay. They call them hacks because they're people that just learn to trim their own horses and they, and, and shoe their own horses. And then they wind up being a farrier and trimming and shoeing others. Okay. I, I don't see nothing wrong with that. Put your shingle out. I don't care. All right. But that's the way farriers are. So um, then he became a full-fledged farrier, you know, and uh, I think the first book he even read on, he talks about the first book. I don't know if it was the first book, but uh, somebody gave him a book on horseshoeing and he started reading it, you know, and then he's pretty, pretty well-written person, you know, well-read. And then, you know, I think he found a lot of different farrier books and read it. And well, he read the whole thing too about frog pressure and lowering heels and stuff like that. I mean, all of this is in farriery. So he himself was indoctrinated with this whole idea. Well, then he runs into Hildred Strasser, who's read all that stuff over there in Germany, okay? Because you can get a lot of these books over there and, and from the UK and France and Germany, because those were the three main places that wrote about the foot of the horse so he runs into hildred strasser who also already believes that the frog must bear the weight okay and them two get together and they start the natural hoof care movement all based on cutting the heels out of a horse and frog pressure a a an anatomical disaster for the horse because no horse on god's green planet earth was ever 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 meant to have this foot here um and this is not even the same foot this is not the foot 
in order to do this drawing, he had to literally cut the heels off, the actual heels that were there. And so even though people are looking <clears throat> at these other pictures, just a minute, eh, I'm lost. My things are, oh, there we go. Um, to make that foot out of this foot here, you know what you had to do? You had to come in and do this. Um, new share. Just a minute here. Okay, got that. Now I need to annotate. Do, 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 do. Where is the annotate? Um, here we go. You have to come in and do that to make that foot. Here's the centimeter right here. You have to come in and do this. He would have had to cut the heel off of his specimens, the, which the heels were already worn down and run down. You know, <clears throat> so they believe. And I, I heard this from David Landerville, who wrote a deal called The Heart of Hoof Development. And he goes, I read somewhere, I think it was Jamie Jackson, that a wild horse's feet improve over their lifetime. And then he says, even if it's not true, I'm going to believe it. Okay. So they might see a foot that actually had heel. And then because they've been taught that this is the foot that is the ideal. They're going to think this is the improvement, see? And so in order to make his drawing, he had to cut, literally cut the heels. Well, nobody even notices because they don't look at this foot. This is not the foot that's pictured all over the internet. This is the foot that's pictured. And, okay, you don't notice this. If you take off this, this mark here that shows heel, you don't notice that this is even the heel. He had to, you know, uh, for a while I was like, well, maybe he didn't know how to mark heels. Maybe he didn't know what he was looking at. But then on this picture here, he literally marked the heels. See? So what? what is up? What is up here? All this contradiction and stuff. See, this is what happens though. And, you know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe we could ask him someday, what were you thinking? You know, what was your, what was your reasoning behind all this? You know, but this much I do know that people do is they come up with a pet idea, something that they want to believe in. And then instead of uh, doing true science and letting, uh, adapting their idea to what the evidence is presenting, they adapt the evidence to their idea. Do you understand what I'm saying? So this happens in science all the time. You know, what you do is you just go out and you start grabbing stuff that agrees with what you already believe. And then, of course, you put it all together and it makes it look uh, <coughs> logical. Like um, what... What uh, Henry Hamerling said about how something can how, look obvious and it can be seductive and it and so you want to believe it and humans are like this and I've had this happen to me numerous times where I'm studying I'm looking for an answer I'm researching something and I get an idea I would see something and I would put two and two and ten together and I would think I had an understanding and be like, wow, you know, it's a light bulb moment. Only to find out later as another piece of information came in that contradicted my bright idea. And so I had to make a choice. Well, I'm going to take my bright idea and put it on the shelf. Or well, I'm just going to ignore this new evidence. You know, we don't want to add that in because that will change my wonderful, bright idea that I had. See, it's a matter, a lot of it's uh, ego, pride, 
you know, preference, being partial, I don't know. So, uh, this is not science in no way, shape, or form, okay? Science doesn't, doesn't go well. You know, we had, had 200, we had 107 samples. Oh, hey, you know, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. That may not be good enough. That may not sound like, like we studied enough. Let's just add to it. See, I don't know if that's what he did. I have no idea what he did. I just know that there's a lot of contradictions. One thing I know for darn sure, this foot here is not uh, this other foot. Let me undo, let's see, annotate. Where are we at here? Eh, well, I'm lost now. Oh, there we go. Undo, close it out. This foot here is not this foot here because he cut the heel off of it. Now, here's something else. Another contradiction I found. To me, it's even worse. All right. He comes up, you know, uh, I've told y'all, you need to read that article by Henry Hammerling, a proper hoof angle, which is really about heel eye. Okay. Because look, if I lengthen the heel and raise this up, it's going to change the angle of the dorsal wall, isn't it? Going to make it steeper, right? And just like if it's high and I lower it, it could lower the angle too, unless I take toe off. Well, not a toe off. So, you know, in in his his paper, research paper on the proper angle, and he goes, oh, God, through all these different beliefs men have had of, oh, you know, look at the shoulder angle, look at the pastern angle. Well, the hoof should be this angle and blah, blah, blah. Well, by this time that Jackson has done this book, he has read up on this stuff, okay? And so, so he's going into it in this book about angles and he comes up with his own theory that nature determines the angle of the dorsal wall uh which he calls the axis see nature determines the axis which is the length of the, the dorsal wall with the ground right here you got the axis just like over here with ovenix he says well nature determines it by the bone and the hoof it is the coffin bone that determines the angle. Well, we know that two thirds of the back of the foot is all cartilage and fat, and that's going to have something to do with it, right? And so, so he comes up with this, uh, uh, what would you call conclusion about, now look at these, don't these all, they, except for down here, he has changed the length of the toe. This is three and a fourth inch, and this is three inches. But this is three inches, this is three inches, and this is three inches, okay? Yet they all have one centimeter heels, right? So his theory is that uh, heel height never changes, and heel height has nothing to do with angle, period. And that... Uh, here, an A says impact of heel length on toe angle. He's going to show you something. And what he's trying to prove here is heel length has nothing to do with it because, you know, so you don't want to be, you know, lengthening heels and all that. Okay, so he says uh, impact of heel length on toe angle. Two feet that are exactly the same length in the dorsal wall. Looky here, toe length three inches toe length three inches they both got the same heel one centimeter see that yet one foot is 60 degrees a 60 degree axis and the other is a 52 how could that be how could that be it's it's like magic you know but that's nature that's how nature does it okay now the other thing he says he found out B, impact of toe length on toe angle. Then he shows you that you can have the same heels, one CM here, 
and one CM here, and one dorsal wall can be three and one fourths, while the other one is three inches, and yet they could be the same angle. How could that be? How could this be longer and this be shorter and the heels the same size and yet they're both the same angle? How could that be? And again, up here, how could this be? They're the same length in the dorsal wall and the same length in the heel, but different angles. How could this be? Well, you know, I want you to notice something about the examples given here. But what, what are we looking at here? Are we looking at a real foot? Drawings. We're looking at freaking drawings. That's right. Now, other than this one here, where it's three and one fourth inches, when you look at these in general, do they all look the same? The same size. Anybody got anything to say about that? Just like, you know, if you're just glancing and you're reading a book and you see these feet, they all look the same, don't they? Anybody got an opinion? No, they don't. <laughs> they don't because they're not. But if you're just reading a book and you look at these in a book, you're not going to notice this. Okay, and so I measured all these feet. Okay, and let me tell you what's different. The distance from here to here on this one is different from the distance from here to here. You know what? That makes a whole difference in what the angle of the dorsal wall is going to be. So the feet were not the same size. See, and uh, same over here with, with this one. Uh, well, and another thing, okay, the heel on this one here is actually just a tad higher than the heel on this one here. But you know what? You wouldn't notice that. Not really. See? And then uh, different on this one here, too. So that's why there are different degrees. Not because it's some sort of marvelous, uh, magical, mystical thing that nature's doing. Because that is what he's coming off in that book as. That it's a marvel, mystical nature. will just can't understand it. You know, nature is so fascinating. Well, I can understand it. Oh, and he makes sure to tell you by no mathematical formula, whatever, can you ever figure this out. Don't be trying none of them mathematical formulas. All right. Well, I did. I tried a mathematical formula. It's called geometry. Okay. And so in geometry, if I got a semi triangle or whatever, and one side is longer than the other, and I've got another triangle over here of a different size, I'm going to come up with a different angle axis. Doesn't that make sense? He must have not done well in that. Uh, well, something he, you know, something's up here. You know, now this is the foot I tried to put on my freaking horse for seven years. Well, let's see, how did it go? Uh, okay, I got into this, never knew all this crap was going on. Okay, so I get into this. And I started with Gene Ovenick's trim. I think I stayed with that for a year or so. And then I started studying more. Uh, I was forced to study more. All right. Because here's what happened. Well, no, no. Well, I'm kind of fuzzy on some of the details. Um, you can tell I'm getting older. Um, okay. So a year, year and a half, I'm doing Gene Ovenick's trim. In the meanwhile, um, Neil loses his job. And so I thought, well, maybe I could start trimming horses. And so I put out my shingle pack that I am. <laughs> and uh, and I started getting trimming jobs. Not a lot, just a few. And one guy I'm still trimming for. Okay. So that's like 18 years almost, 17, 17 years. And uh, because that horse had laminitis, 
all right? Um, I was driven to try and research and understand what was going on with her feet. And it was then that uh, I started learning about Pete Ramey and all that. See, I never even heard of Jackson for a couple years, I don't think. And I never realized that he was the father of Barefoot with Hildred Strasser being the mother. All right. I never, never knew that they had uh, formed this union to develop what they called natural hoof care barefoot trimming, which is all based and can be traced back to them too. But then the stuff they believe can be understood and traced back to William LaFosse and to Professor Coleman and to people who never shod horses before, but wound up being in positions of power and authority that transferred on these falsehoods to people from one generation to the next. Now, I in no way think that, that it, I, well, I'm not going to say what I was going to say there, but anyway, um, here's the thing. You know what? Uh, I can put this, I and I am going to put it together in a flip book, all right? So that uh, you can unbrainwash people with it, hopefully. But here's the thing, what we're going to find. We're going to find there's going to be a large number of people out there that it doesn't matter. Even if they see the truth, <laughs> they're not going to change. You know why? Because people hate to be deceived. They hate to admit they've been deceived. And to admit you've been deceived, that you made a mistake, all right, and that your mistake cost the lives of probably not only horses, but people. See, if a horse is not supposed to have frog contact, if he's not supposed to be walking on his bulbs, first of all, you lower, look at here. Where am I at here? Uh, duh, 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 duh. Okay, so let's look up here. Let's say we have these horn tubules here, like so, right? If I cut this heel off and pull it down to the ground, see, see, here's the bulb right here. That's probably about a centimeter maybe. Okay, and I pull the whole back of this foot down here. What does it do to these horn tubules? It's going to set them like this. Okay. And so now they're growing forward. And what are they going to do? They're going to push that toe forward, right? That's how you wind up, like Mary, with this piece of hoof wall in here that's, you know, this long when it's only supposed to be like this here you know, supposed to be right here. Um, by those heels coming down like that, it changes uh, all the angle of the horn tubules and forces them forward. And of course, if it pulls this coronary band down here, well, the coronary band is what grows them, right? So if it pulls it down here, then it's going to be growing them that way. So that's what, uh, and that is usually what happens here. Um, you know, you got to go back and look at, again, his model. Um, so, so different contradictions. These are contradictions. This is, these are contradictions. There cannot be any contradictions in your conclusions uh, in science and in the way that you came to those conclusions. How did you draw those conclusions? From what information? What is your preconceived biased idea? What are you trying to prove? What, you know, what? Um, and so, okay, so now uh, horses are being crippled, maimed, blamed all over the place because we're trimming the heels out of them. And what's it get blamed on? The trim? No. Diet. Diet 
it's their diet or they don't they're they don't have the right environment you have to have a track system not that there's anything wrong with any of that you understand and not that there's anything wrong with giving your horses the best nutrition that you can but something that's happening is this will trim horses into mechanical laminitis by over lowering these heels like that well then people are told it's what you're feeding your horse well then not only is your horse's feet full of inflammation and sore because the way he's been being trimmed but now you're starving him to death too so you've taken away the two things in that horse's life next to company having company that that horse enjoys the most in life you know everybody knows how much horses enjoy their food right you know and enjoy their feet their feet is where their spirit and their whole life is and so through these mistakes they've taken away this horse's life completely see um and so this is epidemic now thanks to barefoot trimming which again barefoot now represents the trim that came out of this over here these two men's research are not the same and the funny thing is that i see uh uh natural balance farriers thinking they are thinking thinking it's all just barefoot you know it's all just barefoot it's not what gene Ovenick studied the conclusions he came to the example he gives are absolutely contrary to this dude um so yeah there's there's a little, little history lesson for today uh frankly has me a little irritated <laughs> i never like it when i find out you know, I've believed something somebody's told me, and it's not true. You know, um, it's not true. Not true. Sorry. All wild horses don't have a foot that looks like that. Okay. And how do we know that? Well, let's go to the internet and gather pictures up, shall we? See, at the time, nobody had pictures of these horses' feet. And so, you know, uh he says and in his first book when he gives a list bibliography of all the photographies in his book um and just the few pictures he took of that one dead horse's hoof anyway he he thanks all these people for taking the pictures he never could all right by the time you get to your 2020 version um, first of all, he's got a picture of horses running, um, taken by BLM and under it in the caption, he says, yeah, I studied over a thousand head. And, uh, uh, then he's got a picture of, uh, like Gene Ovenix here, just a minute, we'll go there. You think it, let me ask you do you think it's important to know where these people have made mistakes so that we are aware of why people believe what they believe so that we can help them absolutely um let me undo this yeah don't freaking lie to me all right um don't make a mistake to me because I will find it out, all right? Um, I, I'm obsessed with that, okay? Now, I'm not saying that, remember, a mistake is a lie, right? Doesn't mean you lied on purpose. Doesn't mean you, you did it on purpose, but it's still not true, right? So don't not true on me especially if it concerns something that means a lot to me and it fricks with my life and my animal's life or anything that I have charge of, you know, um, 
it's like, okay, me, I learned some of this stuff and I spread it around too. But you know what? Then I come back and I said, hey, this is a mistake. And I, I'm sorry, it's not right. I led you in a wrong direction. You know what? If people would do that, everybody forgive them. You understand that? Because these people have inherited falsehood. And so that was put in their head. And so that then when they went and did their studies, you know, they drew some wrong conclusions. You know, and I would imagine originally and stuff, it was all trying to help the horse, trying to help people. Nobody would make these big giant mistakes on purpose. You know, like, well, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to, I know that I'm supposed to uh, take your, 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 what, your, well, like, you know how you do when you go to a hospital and, and they operate on you and they were supposed to operate on one thing, but they make a mistake and they operate on something else. <laughs> you know, nobody does that on purpose, but, it, but in the long run, did it matter to my horse whether somebody did it on purpose or not? No, my horse is still lame. My horse is still dead. My daughter's horse tripped and killed her uh, because his feet were treated improperly. And this has been going on for 270 years. So I've talked about this with Bracey Clark's book before. He goes into detail about all the horses that were tripping and falling. We don't hear about it as much anymore. But back then, it was front page news. Just like, okay, you know how you always hear about car wrecks now? People getting killed or maimed or lamed or whatever. Well, back then, it was horse wrecks. All right? And Bracey Clark showed how it was because they're trimming the heels out of these horses. It was forcing their toes forward like this. And so they're tripping all over themselves. And people get hurt. You know, so we got the same thing going on here. Forcing the heel, getting the heels out of horses, forcing the toes long. Horses are not, uh, now some horses escape this, right? That's the deceitful part. You know, horses adapt, horses feet adapt. All right. So anyway, let me undo this. Linda. Uh, yeah. What I ask myself, um, I, I, am I right? It's it's not possible that Jamie Jackson knew anything about horn tubules. If he if he had known about them, he could not come to this conclusion that a hoof must look like this. Well, that would be nice. <laughs> you understand what I mean? Yes, I, I understand I, exactly what you mean. Unfortunately. Yeah. Oh no, he's very detailed about that. Okay. Yeah, he's very detailed about what he thinks the horn tubule should be. Okay. Okay. He takes that one dead foot and he describes it to a T. In fact, he even talks about keep trimming that frog down till you don't have no frog left and it's just calloused and your bulbs are on the ground. Uh -huh. So, nope, nope. He knew about horn tubules. He didn't know the right thing about horn tubules. You understand? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He didn't know the right thing because he was making all of his determinations off of this model. You know, that's why he carts it around, I guess, to every, you know, clinic. He's got it on video, um, which I'd like to get that video to see. This is his model. I'm just saying, no, all wild horses do not have that foot. And I also don't believe that every single horse that he looked at However many, I don't know, was it 107? Was it 250? Was it 1,000? Um, however many, I flat don't believe they had one centimeter heels. Okay, and he don't believe it either because he marks the heels on the other, on the other, on the picture of the real hooves. But see, this fit better. This fits better. Um, with something maybe he wanted to believe. I don't know. You know, I don't know. I'd like to know. I'd like to see all of the pictures that he took, that he says he took of those feet. 
See, because he had no pictures of those feet in the original books. In the 1990, 1992, 1997, no pictures. By 2020, he's got one picture in there. And he says that uh, he took pictures of all of them. But of course, he, he posts the worst picture. You know, it's not a good picture at all. What's more, well, let's just look at it. You know? <coughs> just a minute here. Let me get rid of this. Okay. I'll show you the picture. Okay, so fair use, right? For criticism and education. Um, let's look. After all, the horse did belong to the government, <laughs> to the United States, to the American people, for the good of the public. All right, that's why you got the fair use doctrine. Let's see here. Mm -mm 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 -mm. See, I got this other 2020 version book at Barnes and Noble on an ebook. Um, and I got some other ones coming because I'm going to have every one of his books and I'm going to go through them with a the fine tooth comb um, <clears throat> to find all the contradictory statements. Because, see, that's how you, that's science, folks. Okay? Proving yourself wrong. Um, Let's see here. Uh, share screen. Okay, hold on just a minute. Here, we'll put you back on. Back on Gene Obanek there. You know what is about one centimeter? Is the coronary band width. Measured a bunch of those, so I know that. Um, let's see here. Okay, where are you? Yeah, um, just a second here. Okay, and so like here too, here's an example. Um, well, maybe. Eh. New share. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> here is his hind foot. All right. And uh, this is what he made into a one centimeter heel, this little heel bulb up here. He cut this part off. But regardless, this is the foot that's all over the internet that they all think every horse should have. All right, well, here is the foot that Pete Ramey found in a cattle guard in the winter. All right, this horse had two inch heels. I know that for a fact. And a three and a half inch dorsal wall. Okay, so if this, if the heel on this horse stood up, it would at least be like that. And your horn tubules would go like this. The horn tubules do go like this on this foot. So see how people are blinded? Because Pete Ramey is a disciple and follower of Jamie Jackson, yet he's got two of two wild horse dissected feet that are nothing like what he has been taught and what has been put in his head as being the true foot of the horse. And so even though he's got these two examples, great examples, he still tries to get this foot on every horse he trims. And so do his disciples. Because this is a discipleship. You know, what's a disciple? Student, student. I just say disciple because it becomes like a religion, you know? And you know, religions don't change. You know, dogmatic doctrines and denominations, they don't change. They just don't come in one day and say, hey, you know that Trinity thing? Well, we were wrong, you know, or anything else that they believe. You know, I'm just saying, 
you know, this is also a part of our, our history as a people, this belief, having a belief that you consider with religious dogmatic uh, dedication, whether it's true or not. Okay. And uh, if it is true, you shouldn't be afraid if it gets challenged <laughs> that much. So, all right. Uh, well, some things. Let's see. Okay, so just a minute here. <laughs> well this would just show you some of the some of the things I was doing with the feet to show that they're not the same size they're not the same size see look at how the heel this foot, I took this foot here. Okay, this is where I said um, the dorsal wall is the same length and the heel is the same length, yet magically, this one's 60 degrees and this one's 52. And it must be because of the magic bone in the hoof. Okay, so, and again, I say, when you're just looking at the book, you do not notice that these are not the same size. But when you take all the measurements and you put them over here, you find that, well, this bulb was just a tiny bit bigger. And this dorsal, uh, this wall here was just a little bit longer. And the hairline here was just a little bit longer too. Well, you know what that does, right? It's going to make this angle axis different on both feet. Doesn't make a difference if this is the same and this is the same. If this is different and that's different, it's going to differentiate the angle here. Now, you had to work at that. Am I wrong? Wouldn't you have to work at that to get that like that? You know, see, I think because he believes it, that it's okay that this is not a mathematical formula i'm sorry this is a mathematical formula okay and here's another thing we know that when you trim the heels out of a horse that the heels actually move fo forward and make this area from here to here shorter see so the back of the foot growing the heels having the correct heels have a lot to do not only with the height Look at this, this is pretty interesting. Not only with the height here, but it has a lot to do with the length from here to here and from here to here. That in and of itself can wholly change the angle of the dorsal wall. This could be the same foot. This could be a foot with trimmed out heel, okay? Uh, if you added some heel and it lengthened and made the foot bigger, it's going to raise it up. It could change the angle of the dorsal wall. See? Um, but these, the, I've done this stuff too, where I was trying to figure out stuff like that and thought I came to some bright idea only to realize later that I had made a mistake in my calculations. See? So anyway. Okay. But Linda, I think all these uh, researches in Brax were made uh, uh, in a time when the exact me measurements were not uh, very important. I, I think that you're the first one who really wants the, the, the facts to be precise. This precision, I never saw it to other uh, people who work with the uh, hooves. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean... Well, that's the difference. Uh, 
well, because well, you are a person of the detail. Well, that, that may be, but he is pretty detailed about the fact of how long the dorsal walls were, how he was able to thoroughly examine. Yes, first, but uh, now, if somebody first, is very detailed in Brax, he's pretty it detailed. Cannot, yes, but he cannot do these mistakes when he draws something. When he what? Here to you go. this 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 kind of conclusions uh, so lightly yeah how could you make these kind of mistakes i would like to know um look here here's the 2020 book okay it says here young stallion with pinto markings pursued by wranglers headers and heels secure horses with ropes stretch out on the ground I was able to measure, examine, and photograph over 1,000 wild horse hooves just removed from several uh, HMAs. So what is it? 107? Is it 250? Oh, it's 1,000. Now it's 1,000. Hmm. Interesting. Yet, in the first book, not, well, maybe maybe one slight picture. I'll have to look at it again, but next to nothing, comparatively speaking to what he said. I mean, I'm just a novice. I'm not even educated. But I got more pictures of my dissection than the hooves and the work that I have done than he did. In a four-year period of time, supposedly studying wild horses, 1,000 hooves. Well, I want to see these pictures. See, I'm not going to take his word that my horse has to have one centimeter heel. See? You know, you, know, you see, I'm going to put all these blatant contradictions together in a flip book. So you can just show people and say, what do you think of that? What do you think of that? How come Mahil's missing here? How come he said 107 here, 250 here, and 1,000 here? Where are those pictures? Where is that proof? See, by 2020, you know, after you've gone like, what? How many years from 1990 or however long he was there? 38 years, I think he said. Well, you're pretty, con you're pretty comfortable by then. That everybody believes this and you believe it too. He believes this too, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. I just, perhaps he did do it. I would just like to see more evidence from him, you know? Because the only evidence I see are when I'm on these hoof groups, one freaking lame horse after the next that people are trimming the heels out of. So, that's a big deal here. What he says here. I was able to measure, examine, and photograph over 1,000 wild horse hooves just removed. Got to make sure you say that because, you know, there was no excess growth from several HMAs. And then, yeah. So this is your barefoot trimming, folks. This is the research it's based on. Yep. You know, how much money has this cost me, you? You know, what about all these people who take all these clinics, classes, buy the books? See? Anyway, uh, this, I don't like this at all. I want to see, I want to see his, his, I want to see that thousand pictures of those hooves. Oh, okay, maybe it became, oh, I see why it wound up being a thousand. Because he did 250 horses. If you times that by four feet, why George? That's a thousand feet, huh? See? Well, that that explains the mystery. Oh, there we go. 
maybe 1000 is a way of speaking yeah whatever <laughs> a way of speaking that yeah but you know what that's not science that's not science a way of speaking is not science you better be accurate you know where are the pictures i want to see the pictures and even like i said even his own feet don't have heels that are one centimeter high so there you go anyway all right Linda, so, yeah sorry to interrupt but i'm um, talking about um pictures I sent you some from um, the horse we wanted to chat about. And, you know, it's getting late yeah, here okay. in Germany. So, so I'm going to get off of this subject. <laughs> Sorry. And, uh, got a fly that's bothering me. Um, I'll get off this subject and we'll do that. But, you know, this is food to think about. You know. Absolutely. Okay, so. I gotta find you again. You're lost in here. Yeah, sure. and and is it possible that we do this like um, offline and? Yeah, we can do this offline. Okay, so um, before we do that, I got one thing I want to do here, which is show this video of how extra soul this gal did of extra soul. Well, we could do that offline too, and stuff since it's her video, and so um yeah, so we're gonna get off of uh, YouTube. <clears throat> Um, and, uh, uh, we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna cancel out and then we're gonna do this horse that, that you want to do. And I'll talk to you some more, Mary Bert, about, um, helping your horse and correcting his heels, which we did talk about, uh, trimming some more of that frog out, especially in the center and, uh, lowering the walls in the quarters and beveling so the hoof, hooves have room to the horn tubules have room to move back okay 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 so let me close that out man i hate those flies okay let's see here yeah probably be it, 